And you know, the reason I wanted to look at this video is because of a few reactions that I saw. And the reactions were all from young 20 something YouTubers who all basically thought that Jason was being a dick calling out gamers and Yang was kind of just like the heroic representative for gamers. But that's not what I see. And in fact, this interview it was the result of a dispute he had with Jason Schreier, who was the co-author of the article we just read about Amazon, um, who basically said, why y'all YouTubers got to be so negative all the time? It's bullshit. And Jason's going to come on to Yang Ye's show and talk all about that. And um, I actually found this by way of seeing a few video reactions to this. And it seems like, for the most part, they, they paint Jason Schreier as kind of the big meanie in this. But after watching through the first little bit of it, I kind of suspect that there's truth in both points of view. And they're both still relevant today in 2021, a year and some odd months later after it was recorded. So let's, um, let's start off with it. I think the rest of it will explain itself. Upset about things are getting annoyed. Hello, everyone. Welcome to a games industry discussion with... Uh... Jason Schreier here, who was kind enough to join us. So first things first, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Hello, Young. Thank you so much for having me on your channel. I appreciate it. Sure thing. Um, obviously, we haven't seen eye to eye on everything, but uh, I think that's no reason to come together and just talk, share our perspectives, uh, see what we can learn and uh, move forward, because I think ultimately Amen that's to more that, than, Love that you know, sentiment. Like just the back and forths that, that are that Proper conversation. spontaneously. And Proper conversation requires that both parties believe they can learn something from the other person. Let's see if they do that here, but it's okay to disagree. Something we need to learn to do a little bit more, I think, in our modern, um, ever homogenizing culture on the internet. And sporadically. So um, I hope we can, uh, yeah, have something productive here to share with the audience. And uh, I'm really excited to hear your insight on some of the recent events. Yeah, I mean, I actually think that you and I agree on more things than mm -hmm. even we have talked about. Um, I just think I think we have a few key differences that I'm hoping to chat sure. about. But yeah, let's let's jump right yeah, in. Yeah, let's just jump right in. Um, obviously, the big topic right now: microtransactions and loot boxes. Uh, for me, it really became apparent uh, how prevalent this was all. Uh, this all was after Battlefront Two. I, mm -hmm. They were kind of there in the back of my mind, like Metal Gear Solid Five had like a bit of microtransactions here and uh, like Assassin's Creed 3 back in the day. I remember like some people complained about the microtransactions there, but I think once uh, the Battlefront 2 debacle began, that's when it really started to pick up. And so I guess uh, something a lot of people are wondering is what is your stance? Where, where do you think one draws the line? Because there was that one moment when you talked about Assassin's Creed Odyssey and you expressed mm -hmm. adamantly that uh, this is, uh, in your perspective, blown out of proportion, that this is fine, that this is not intrusive uh, versus others who are saying this is kind of bullshit. So mm -hmm. where do you stand on that front? Yeah, so, okay. So I think microtransactions are a very complicated topic. And mm -hmm. I, as, just as a personal interest, am much more uh, inclined to talk about how did we get here? Mm -hmm. Why are companies doing this? Why are we at this point where it feels like every single game has to have all these add-ons on top of the already pricey $60 entry right. point? Right. Um, that's my. That's in general what I prefer to talk about than just getting mad about the latest controversy. Sure. Um, this is, this is a common thread of this discussion. Uh, talking rather than getting mad. I think maybe that Jason grew up in a household where getting mad wasn't really allowed or yelling wasn't really allowed. Because this seems to be a complaint he has throughout this um, discussion. Um, but yeah, I want us to think as we listen in... Um, what the role of getting mad has in gaming for us and the wider industry. And I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna screw with my green screen settings on the side so that my mic doesn't sparkle. We'll see how well I do there. Rel said loot boxes saved planet side though. They did. You gotta have money to, to make games. It's, it's, uh, how can you make money without, without making evil is the question. There are good ways of doing it. 
Um, whether or not the way Planside did it was good or not, it can be debated. But, uh, and I think Young, too, it's worth mentioning that Young is a young guy. Like, he grew up in, with a phone in his hand, I'm guessing. Um, he's used to free-to-play games from a young age, which is something that didn't exist when Jason Schreier was younger. Um, he comes from a bit of an older ilk. I think Jason's closer to my age. I'm in my late 30s. Um, and uh, you bought games, period. Only to play a game is to buy it. Um, there was shareware, uh, which is kind of a, was kind of an ephemeral concept. But other than that, um, gaming industry, gaming was a pay-to-play hobby, always. The, the modern state that it's in, where it's, it's, it's pushing the boundaries further and further of how low can we make the entry point in terms of, of, of money spent, and how high can we push the ceiling in terms of what is, this, is the most someone could possibly spend. Those are both being constantly pushed at. Um, but yeah, let's uh, continue. So Battlefront 2 is an interesting case that was at the end of a whole lot of microtransaction controversies mm -hmm. last year, including uh, Shadow of War, and uh, I think there was some bad stuff with uh, one of the racing games, forgetting which one. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. then, and some of those were egregious. I mean, Battlefront 2 was very clearly egregious. Yes. Um, jump to last month, Assassin's Creed Odyssey, and what you're pr probably referring to is a couple of tweets that I sent out where I mm -hmm. talked about how um, I personally did not notice or mind the microtransactions, yes. and I saw some articles and some YouTube videos about how Assassin's Creed Odyssey has this XP booster, mm -hmm. and that ruins the game. And I've done a lot of thinking and talking about like that XP booster and its existence. Have you played the game? Have you played Assassin's yes, I Creed have. Odyssey? I have. have you finished it or just played I've, some of it? I've not finished it, but I'm like uh, more than halfway through. But eventually, and just have you noticed out. the XP booster at all? I I wish I would have the option to toggle it without it mm -hmm. being paywalled. I will say that I, I wish I could just even if it's not even if people are fine with. Uh, I'm going to flip the cam up for a couple minutes while I eat off mic while we're watching this together. I'll be tripping in still, but something about seeing someone eating on camera, I've never liked, so I'm not going to do it myself. The non-XP boosted version of the game. I do wish I had the option to enable that so I could maybe speed things along in certain sections of the game, mm -hmm. um, because... Uh, there, for example, I recently started playing Diablo 3 on Switch. What I love about that game is that uh, it has multiple difficulty modes, each with their own sort of XP rate. Um, so I started with the lowest difficulty, but the XP rate was slow and I found the game too easy. And then I could just say, okay, I don't want that to happen anymore. So I could just go back to the main menu, switch back to expert mode or master mode, and I got like 200% XP, but also the enemies were much harder. And so I, I love that. And uh, so in Odyssey, that was kind of stripped away, I felt. Uh, not killed mm -hmm. the game, but uh, I wish I had that option for sure. The actual, I think, player choice, you know? Yeah, so you so you felt like the level balance was off for you and you wish you could have sped it up? You felt like you were running into difficulty, difficulty spikes? Yeah, especially towards uh, sort of the latter half of the game. Um, mm -hmm. there, some might argue, unless... I think if you've been doing a lot of side quests, like you've just been clearing everything as you go along, you're mm -hmm. probably not going to notice it. But there are people who kind of maybe want to clear the story first and then maybe do some side quests. And reviewers. <clears throat> That's how reviewers play video games. They don't do all the content. They do the content that seems important to do. Something to think about whenever you watch anyone who's a games journalist talk about games. They probably haven't played it as much as you have, or will. And play mm -hmm. at their own pace. There are some people out there, some crowds, that I think will certainly have felt that. Uh, that so here's the yeah. problem. I mean, the problem with the XP booster is that the fact that it exists just creates that seed of doubt in our minds. And mm -hmm makes us wonder oh my god was this difficulty scaling built so they could sell us this ten dollar package mm -hmm. and that i think is a bigger it's a more insidious problem than the fact that the game has microtransactions the fact that it plants a seed of doubt in your mind and the fact that it's 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 such a different form of commodity than just 
exchanging money for something. It's mm-hmm. not quite the same as buying an outfit, um, mm-hmm. which also, I mean, not enough people are talking about how egregious it is that you have to spend like seven fifty for a unicorn skin. That's a whole other thing. Yeah. But uh, is that but, earnable uh, in game? Uh, do you know? I don't know. I don't think so. But the the fact that you you can pay for this thing that just affects the game mm-hmm. in this intangible way, I think that is what really bothers people. Mm-hmm. And I get that. But I think it's also really important to know and to be honest about your perspective on things. And when I played the game, I felt like, oh, my God, like this sure. feels like one of those controversies that is just being turned into headlines because it is there. So Jason's wanting to skip to, um, boing, here I am. I'll try to turn my camera on when I talk. Jason's wanting to skip to the meta narrative around gaming and dissatisfaction, gamer rage, which is what he wants to talk about. But before we bring it up to that level, what he's talking about with the XP booster, um, you create the problem and you sell the solution. This is like an age old business principle. And it works up until it works to the extent that people are generally not aware that you're creating the problem yourself. So I didn't play Assassin's Creed Odyssey. It's not the kind of game I would ever play. Um, <clears throat> having an experience boost is the kind of thing that, like in my boomer mentality, is the kind of thing you'd want to do from the console or a download a mod to do. Like... The idea that you would have something that materially affects your gameplay in a single player game that you buy. And it's 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 not like a a new game feature or game system. It's like just changing a number. Um it's pretty it's pretty fucking mask off. And I think game publishers like EA are starting to sell their games, get them reviewed, and then turn on these kinds of microtransactions after the fact as well. So they still read the, the microtransactions cost while getting the positive press for not having them in the game in the original bills that reviewers got their hands on. Um, Jason alluded to the reality that um, if you know it's there, it's going to bother you. Um, I mean, different gamers will feel that way. Um, if you're like a power gamer, which a lot I think is becoming much more of an accepted way to play video games as time goes on, um, it's going to bother you to turn down any optimization you could access. Um, the idea that the point of the game is to be good at it and to master it, to conquer the game world, is one that I think is well and perhaps overserved. When it comes to the way games are designed now, we have been for a little while. And so, um, if you're that mentality, then turning down a power boost um, would would feel difficult. And the idea that a power boost would be behind a paywall would feel potentially enraging. If you're someone who's there to play through the experience, um, and you get stuck doing boring gameplay that you could have sped through faster if you had the experience boost. I could see that also affecting people who are more of like the explorer mindset. And when I, when I refer to these, I'm using Bartle types. So when I talk about conquering the world, that's called an achiever type, someone who wants to enact their will on the world. Someone who wants to interact with the world is called an explorer. I'm much more of an explorer myself. And you can take those same two verbs and apply them to people. Someone who wants to act on and conquer people is a killer in the Bartle typing. Someone who wants to interact with people is a socializer, Bartle typing. Uh, my score when I last looked at it was S-E-K-A, socializer, heavily socializer, explorer, like upper middle, killer, lower middle, and achiever, bottom basement. So that's just the perspective I'm coming at it from. And I think journalists like these guys could do a better job of level setting these things when they talk about these things. But... Um, Yeah, I, I, I'm I probably not the right person to talk about this because I don't have a lot of experience playing single-player games anymore. But selling microtransactions for single-player games always seems a bit dodgy to me. 
unless you're adding significant content when you do so. If all you're doing is adding in something like a cosmetic, it's like, that's what you used to call on-disc DLC back in the day. I think, I think Street Fighter got burned for this too, where they shipped a game and they put content on the shipped disc, the piece of physical hardware you put into your console, but that some of the content only gets activated when you pay more than the full price of the game. What price should games be? I mean, that's another conversation I'm not going to get into, but there are loads of ways to make, to make people feel bad about, about paying for shit on the sly. And they're there because some people will just pay for everything. Admittedly, if I like a game, I'm the kind of person who's more likely to pay. Deep Rock Galactic, an example of a game I played last year. I think it cost like 20 or 30 bucks to buy, and I didn't hesitate to drop more than that amount on visual cosmetics that I didn't even really use, but I just wanted to support the game. But uh, I'm really digressing at this point. Let's get back to Jason and Young. There. Mm -hmm. And that I think is interesting. And part of me felt like at the time, I mean, first of all, a lot of this, uh, one of the problems here is that people just take tweets and assume that this is like, like they, they look at my Twitter feed and mm -hmm. look at one of my tweets and say, oh my God, this is like, this guy's chiseling his opinion in stone, as mm -hmm. opposed to me just like, like writing a stray thought and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. putting it out there. Um, and we'll get to that in a little bit, because sure. we're going to talk a little bit more about that in relation to Diablo Immortal. Sure. But with this, um, I, it felt to me like it was something that this massive incredible game that i was playing my thought was oh my god like i don't even notice this xp booster mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but i can totally understand why people feel like it's 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 very present is irritating them and i think we're at this point where video game publishers are trying to find more and more ways to get that extra oh, yeah. revenue stream out of their games and i think that going down that route is always going to be room for problems it's always going to be it's always going to raise questions about like the way that the mm -hmm. game was designed but that to me doesn't seem nearly as egregious as some of the, as some of the other things we've seen battlefront 2 is a perfect example and right. i think one of the problems with the way that we have these discussions is that it puts everything on the same level it's almost like like it's uh, there's no level of prioritization there's no level of like oh my god this is really egregious versus this is okay whatever it's not that big a deal and i think that that we as a quote-unquote video game community for lack of a better term need to like it, it, when we get this angry about everything, I think it creates this poisonous world where uh, we are hurting a lot of people. And I think that gamer rage is a real problem. And I think a lot of that is caused as a result of not being able to prioritize and not being able to see the difference between something like Assassin's Creed Odyssey, where it's like, okay, this XP booster plants this idea in my mind. It's kind of annoying. I hate that it even exists, which I totally agree with that, versus... Uh, Battlefront 2, where you have to pay more if you want to get good at the multiplayer, at least before they removed all the microtransactions. Point being, um, I think that it's really important to see the levels in this and to not just treat everybody, everything, as if it is, quote-unquote, cancerous, as if it is exploitative. And that's the, the things that I was saying mm -hmm. on Twitter. Are Once heard Zoom says, talking about anger, I remember an old Jim Inquisition episode where he talked about how the rage of gamers going after a politician in Australia who wanted to ban R-rated games, <clears throat> I think actually caused a more proper dialogue, got to fight irrationality with another form of irrationality if common sense can't be used. Yeah, that sounds like just something Jim Sterling would say. I like Jim a lot. Um, he's, one, he's a very unique and worthwhile voice in the conversation. Um, I think that for what it's worth, actually, Jim has contributed to some of what Jason is complaining about. And Jason's bit off a... He's bit off a bit of a monster here because <clears throat> he's not mad at Yong. He's mad at gamers. And no wonder people who react to this take this personally. Um, you fight irrationality with another form of irrationality. If common sense can't be used. I'm thinking about that idea. The idea that common sense can't be used is something that could bear further examination, that notion. Why would common sense be unusable? Um, I think that the, 
a way to look at that at that idea would be to suggest that <clears throat> people feel common sense is unusable in situations where there's a power differential, where they're kind of the victim of, or they perceive themselves as the victim of someone else, of a powerful person's decisions. Like, for example, a game publisher um, who creates these, these cancerous, quote-unquote, microtransactions. And um, unfortunately, the kind of dialogue that these publishers engage in is nothing, is not, is not written in letters. It's written in numbers. They look at what sells. And the things that people say do have an ability to affect that. And we saw that with Battlefront. I mean, as much as Jason is saying that Battlefront was a, was a good target for anger, um, I mean, and Odyssey was not. Okay, there are too many ideas here. I need to unpack them a little bit more. I'm sorry, let me back up for a second. Fighting irrationality with irrationality is one of those things that, to me, temperamentally, it just seems like it raises the volume. And there can be utility in that. I think a great example of that is what we're seeing right now with GameStop, actually, with the Wall Street bets trauma going on. Um, there's not a lot of rational discourse happening about with the phenomenon with GameStop being pumped up, the, the, hedge, the Wall Street hedge funds that were, sh that were short shorting them i think um and that's something that i despair of because i'm a person who obviously loves to talk and i despair when i feel like there's not room for actual conversation i have to try to talk to some of my friends about what's going on with them and they and their attitude is more or less lol i finally get to use my trolling skills like they're just they're just happy to be part of the part of the unhappy mob which is uh something i can't relate to myself and, um, but I will admit that just raising the profile of a problem has usefulness and the Jim Sterlings of the world do that. The young yays of the world do that. Um, fighting a rational fire with irrational fire can do that. Um, people are thinking about the way hedge funds should, should act. Um, people are thinking about, um, what the what the power of retail investors should be in the market. Um, people who are working at hedge funds, I'm sure are thinking about they're, they're updating the way that they, they value things and are, are including things like wall street bets now in, in, in their, um, their polling of tastemakers of what, what actually is going to move the market. And I'm sure that they have are putting their own people in there to help move that conversation in a way that benefits them too. I mean, that's just what you do or sorry. I shouldn't say that. It's what they do. Um, I shouldn't say that it's virtue. I shouldn't suggest that it's virtuous to act disingenuously. I don't think it is. It's just the practical reality that we must all face. Um, but yeah. And interestingly enough, once they're at Zoom, I think that your comment about about fighting irrational with, with irrationality is kind of a little bit what we're seeing in this conversation. And that's where I thought, why I thought I could come in and lay some commentary over the top because both sides are going to make some good points that are worth listening to, I think. Um, and gamer rage. We're going to just play a little longer. Let's go are that I think when you are screaming, when people are screaming, not necessarily, I'm, I'm not going to name names here, but I think when there's this world when we're just shrieking constantly about everything, I think it just creates this poisonous discourse. It leads to um, just lots of toxicity. It leads to uh, game developers burning out. It leads to hardcore game players just not wanting to be involved anymore. I was going to add that too, that it's worth noting for context that Yang Ye's interaction with people in gaming is from behind a from behind a webcam talking to editing software. Jason though is a journalist who talks to people to game developers personally. So he's going to have a, a perspective that's colored by those interactions. And we should listen when we hear what he has to say to hear where the ideas he's going to he's going to be repeating might be coming from. Because 
he is a gamer himself. It's clear from talking to him. I'm sure a lot of these are, a lot of these are his own opinions, but I'm also sure a lot of what we're going to say, what he's going to say, is going to be complaints or uh, things that are filtered through him from the people that he talks to. Context is everything. It leads to less people taking it less seriously when there are real problems. It just causes a lot of problems. Um, well, I and yeah, go ahead. The notion that it's the thing is, uh, people understand that Battlefront Two is far worse than Assassin's Creed Odyssey. It's just mm -hmm. that I don't think that necessarily excuses what Assassin's Creed Odyssey is doing with the XP boosters. And I guess part of it is that different people have different criteria for what they deem acceptable. Um, like I, for example, I think if something is cosmetics, no random chance that you can just purchase directly. If it's reasonably priced and reasonably allowed to obtain via gameplay, um, and uh, it, it also helps if it's free to play versus single player, but mainly those that, that first three criteria uh, I, I think then people kind of overlook it. Like Fortnite, not a lot of people are talking about how egregious Fortnite is. There's some segments who say, I think some of the skins are overpriced. Uh, but, but there is this system where you get the, the battle pass. You can, um, sort of, if you play a lot of the game, you can earn all of it and earn enough currency to, to buy the next battle pass. And so it encourages gameplay where you play and you earn the rewards. Whereas with Assassin's Creed Odyssey, it affects gameplay, but there's no way to earn that via gameplay. It's just something that's paywalled for an additional $10 for a feature that some might desire. Uh, so. So. What do you guys think the distinction between earning something by opening your wallet and earning something in game is? Like, why do people care about that? Sip. I think there are a lot of reasons. First order reasons. When the rewards that you experience in game all come from playing the game, it makes the world that is contained by that game more convincing. Once you're zoom, I think younger people care more because their time is worth less. They have less things to do with it. I think that's probably some truth there. Um, the the I think common observation is right. Um, students, younger people have lots of time and not much money. Older people, uh, people with you know, hopefully careers and families, have money but not much time. So it gives a way for to level the experiences. And what Yang Ye is, pro is proposing this kind of like golden path for microtransactions where you can get them by paying or by playing is like a, is like a broadest possible solution type, type thing. Um, you don't, you're not forced to pay, but you're not forced to play. And there are a lot of games that do this. Um, thinking specifically of like the MMOs that we mentioned earlier about the modern ones who kind of designed for single player for you to play, where um, it's possible to earn the, get the, um, the shop rewards by playing the game and, uh, or just by paying. In one game specifically that I play called Guild Wars 2, there are second and third order effects of that phenomenon that play out. Um, I'll give you an example. Mounts were introduced as a significant new feature of the game's second expansion, Path of Fire, that was published at the end of 2017. Mounts in Guild Wars 2 feel fantastic. They're actually really cool. And um, unlike in a game, like an older school game, like World of Warcraft, say, where the, the, your mount either walks or flies and that's it in guild wars 2 the mounts have like abilities they have animations and movement speeds they have different um they can jump higher they can jump far they can float over water like they do a lot of different things i know wow mounts have some of these variations too but um 
Guild Wars mounts were, in, were built with personality in them. And you can change the way they look. Um, let's say that you're like a fiery dude and you want to have a fiery mount. You can get that. But you can't get it in game. You can only get it through the shop. So because in Guild Wars 2... I'm sorry. That's not strictly correct. The impression that I get is that because you can earn shop currency by playing the game, ArenaNet, who develops Guild Wars 2, and NCSoft, who publishes it, feel that there's no need to put certain avenues of rewards into, into the game as, as earnable rewards. So what happens is the gameplay gets reduced to what earns shop currency the most efficiently. And so rather ha than having experiences where it's like, oh, I got this sword from this boss. I had to kill him 300 times to get it to drop. And you see that sword out in the wild, and you know this person like had this experience. You can connect what someone's showing with what someone did. You can tell the story. It's more of a role-playing experience. Or I have this prestigious mount from being one of the first 100 people to clear this raid. Or something like that. Or even just an insanely rare thing. What you have is a world in Guild Wars 2 where no matter how much new content gets released, no matter what gets added to the game, every single day, there are thousands of Guild Wars players that do nothing but run the same 45-minute event that was created in 2014 on a loop because it's the most efficient way to gain gem, stop, gem shop currency. Because the need to have all current all gem shop items earned by earnable earnable through playing the game without actually putting the rewards into the game mean that there's a standard set by how to earn that shop currency. So that's like an indirect effect of that choice. And I think that games like those are experiencing the long tail effects of those choices. So because, because there are so many types of customizations in Guild Wars, which is one of those Western-style games that really only sells convenience and um, appearance through their, their shop. Um, because of that, all customization of your character visually feels meaningless to people like me. Because it's just people who are running Silver Wastes, which is the name of the con content, on a loop every single day, or paying in with their wallets. And that to me is like, it's like, it's like being one of those tourists who goes around in an air conditioned RV and never leaves it. You're here, but you're not really experiencing what this place is, what this world is. You're apart from it. And the game incentivizes that apartness. But Yang Ye is a guy who is has to play a lot of games. And because he has to play a lot of games, he probably doesn't have to experience a lot of these long tail effects. Um, that's interesting. Has someone done, done analysis of how many hours equated to a dollar earned? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm sure you can find that kind of analysis. I mean, it's going to change over time because there are certain environmental variables that that affect it. Um, and uh, but like the last time I looked at it, one Sir Zoom, which is probably like two two and a half years ago. Um, to me, as someone who worked full time in tech, um, the time required to do that was not worth it for me. I basically never put in-game money into the gem shop. I was one of the people who either abstained from the gem shop, or if I wanted something, I'd buy it. I'd buy it with real-world money. And I think over the course of six years playing Guild Wars 2, just under 3,000 hours played, I think, I have probably dumped in like a couple hundred dollars into Guild Wars. And that includes for my account and my wife's account 
where we actually played that game together for like two years. Um, and I, I invested that money happily in Guild Wars because it was a game that gave me way more than like $200 worth of value out. In fact, it's a game that I would much prefer to pay like a subscription fee for, at least when I was playing it. Because then, then I could just like... I, I, I find that there's there's like a psychic stress imposed by having to go to the gem shop to get the rewards out of the game um, that I just don't like it, it it and this is this is something that I don't think casual weekend gamers get to see I don't think I think it's something for the core audience that is shopping around for an experience that's gonna grab them and suck them into the world and or who need to feel mastery um, And I don't think either of these guys really lives in that world because uh, Yong is much more of a news headline-y kind of guy, um, plays popular games, just kind of surfs them. And Jason is, a, is an industry guy. He's interested in, in the, how the sausage gets made. Clearly, he has his own gaming preferences too, but he doesn't put them front and center. But let's go back to those guys. Even if you don't, uh, per se... That doesn't mean that there aren't people who do desire that, uh, who, who think that the game would be better off with that XP booster activated. And I don't think them expressing anger over that necessarily uh, is unjustified or is uh, sort of... They're not saying it's as bad as Battlefront 2, but they're also not going to say, hey, this is acceptable either. So to think, just say I it's think, an annoyance is yeah, downplaying I mean that. When you say express anger, I mean, I think that's one of the real fundamental problems mm -hmm. with the game industry right now is anger and this rage that is just cultivated and instilled and is just so constantly ubiquitous mm -hmm. in the video game industry. This rage, this anger, like, oh, my God, the $60 game that happens to be uh, one of the best assassins. Another layer to this, too, that's kind of cool, is it, is it these guys are basically both game journalists. And they're both a huge part of setting the tone of gaming conversations. So they're kind of like the right people to be having this conversation in a way. And I think this is, Jason is kind of indirectly holding Young accountable for his part in the anger culture. Which, by the way, is debatable. I'm not saying I necessarily agree. Creeds by far, like this incredible open world RPG that is like so well designed and full of interesting stuff and humongous. You can spend 200 hours playing this. It is, uh, would you agree with me when I say that the video game industry right now and the quality of video games is as high as it's ever been? For certain games, yes. For others, in general, I'm just saying in general. I'm not saying I. I know there are some series that are in the yeah. shitter. I'm not. I'm not arguing that point. But I'm saying in general, right now, if you go into Steam, the number of games you can play. I mean, everyone's always talking mm -hmm. about their backlogs, their Steam backlogs. And um, right now, I mean, I just finished Red Dead Redemption Two, which is yeah absurd. Yeah, of course. Um, and now I'm moving on to Return of the Obra Dinn and Hitman Two and all these other games mm -hmm. that I want to play. We're at this point where video games are an incredible place. Yeah, they the are, fidelity you know, these, is amazing. Uh, and their graphical fidelity, yeah. they're hitting all these artistic bars, mm -hmm. yeah. yet at the same time, there's so much rage. Yeah. And to me, it's like looking at a game like Assassin's Creed Odyssey, it's $60. For $60, you are getting so much more mm -hmm. and so much a better game than so many of the things. Like if you look back, I don't know how long you have been following the video game industry, but if you look back even eight years ago, 10 years ago, mm -hmm. at the types of games that were being released for the same exact price, it is like, like beyond belief how much better this is in every way quantity and quality right and so we're at this point where it's 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 hard for me to accept that there should be rage about these things like okay you want to get annoyed that this game is an xp booster fine you want to get annoyed that this game has this annoying microtransaction and it's just like like should not be there it ruins the, the integrity of the game i i am with you there 100 percent. but i think when you turn that into like i am now going to spend four hours a day in the comments on youtube and reddit screen or, or social media screaming at developers and just getting upset about every new controversy week after week i think that is where you hit a point where i mean for me it's incomprehensible before young responds <clears throat> once they're at Zoom, your observation matches more or less what I know about the guy and my own impression. And just so folks know what I'm talking about, uh, you said, Yong seems like the kind of guy you watch cathartically to have a conduit for your anger. I think what you said also 
speaks to is is kind of a, at least a partial answer to the question that I wish these guys would ask each other, and maybe they will. <clears throat> which is, why do people get angry? Jason is saying that their anger is unjustified. Young, which kind of puts Young in the position of saying their anger is justified. But neither of them are really answering the question of why are people angry? Um, and Jason's making some good points. The gaming is in a better state that's ever, that's ever been. I think one of the answers has got to be social media. We have more more ability to express opinions than we've ever had. And one of the things I like to repeat is that human beings have no idea like how to adapt to social media. We've only had it for a few years, but we've been around for a lot longer than that. Um, I mean, we're talking about generational leaps in the way that people make their lives within the same generation. And uh, these guys who probably have like, what, 10 15 years apart, I'm guessing, age-wise? Not sure exactly. Very clearly come from different worlds. Like, different gaming worlds, it feels like. Um, and I just... Generationally, I identify more with Jason, personally. But I'm also sympathetic with Yong. And I think what we're going to hear from Yong is a lot of um, rep representation of the younger gamer who experienced gaming from through a lens of social media from an early age where feelings and gaming are something that have always gone together whereas for jason it was kind of different and um there's also a broader topic that, that's at play here of just anger in general um there's a lot of anger online period um the platforms that exist online tend to tend to amplify the simpler ideas and the simpler feelings. And anger is one of the simplest feelings out there. Um, and it, the idea that game publisher evil bad and want my money is a simple idea. Like, it's not the complete truth, but it is a simple one. And anger at that, at that idea, is something that's easy to get a lot of consensus behind because it's simple and people can point to it and say, yeah, I see that. I see that idea. Whereas, like, a more complex proposal, it's like to say, well, like, like, price tolerance for gaming hasn't moved in the last 20 years, but the cost of producing video games has increased dramatically. So how do we, how do we, how do we make sure that we're getting money back? And the amount of money that games get back, like, it's interesting. Like, there are some games that make all the money, all the fucking money in the world, make way more money than they need. Fortnite, example. And there are some games that just barely get by. Um, I wonder how much, like, CDPR made on The Witcher. I mean, I think it's pretty evident they did fine, but you take a game that has cultural, like, a similar amount of cultural relevance, like, I don't know, let's think about it. Do you think The Witcher has the same amount of cultural relevance as, like, a Call of Duty? Maybe Call of Duty has more cultural relevance. I'm not sure. In, in like, games journalism, The Witcher seems to have a bigger place because it's just something a little more unique. But Medal of... I mean, sorry, Medal of Duty. <laughs> it all fucking runs together, those games in my head. Um, Call of Duty prints a fucking enormous amount of money. I gotta drop fewer F-bombs. It's a note to myself I'm watching my last video. Drops a ton. I mean, they just make a ton of money for what they do. And um, as long as they don't cross certain boundaries, like the one um, that they're agitating about with, with Assassin's Creed, then no one really questions it. And it's an interesting world now because of the, the inventive ways people are, are creating to get value from gaming experiences, from gamers. Um, I don't know. I think that Yong's kind of stamp to say, here are my three criteria and this is good, is a little overly simplistic. Um, but I'm not sure what Jason thinks the right balance is yet. And maybe, maybe he'll say so. Um, I hope he can come down on a more defined complaint than gamer anger bad.
Call of Duty has more of the casual, I'd say. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Agreed. Okay. But and we're only 13 minutes into this thing. I got to shut up. Here's the thing. <laughs> How do you change a, a circumstance like Battlefront 2 without an outrage? I mean, do you think that EA would have backpedaled on things like Battlefield 5, uh, with, with, which has no loot boxes, or Anthem, which they say will have no loot boxes? FIFA still does, but, you know. Uh, w would you say that backpedaling would have happened without some think, sort of no, outcry? See, I think that is, yeah, I think there are times when it is justified to go out and be like you know what i'm going to start this this consumer movement together i think the xbox drm was a very good example of a way that a group of people who are really upset and want to stop something can mm -hmm. get together and do that but even then it was like with battlefront 2 the the level of discourse that i saw it's just like it goes beyond like here i am a passionate person and mm -hmm. i am really against this and it just goes into i mean i've looked at your youtube comments like it's the the level of discourse course that you have is different than the the anger and rage and outrage and and just toxicity that i'm seeing expressed by people and i think that is a real problem and i think people like you and me with a platform i think one of our responsibilities because we speak to these big audiences is to say hey like maybe you don't need to be so angry maybe that anger is is not really healthy for anybody and for me personally and we mm -hmm. will probably get into this but something that i find really concerning i I am someone who really deeply cares about video games. I, I really I. want, yeah. love video games, want them to be better. Um, and I am also someone who talks to a lot of people who make video games. That's not corporations. That is not uh, the the corporate shill mm -hmm. conversation. Right, which yeah. Well, I don't, yeah. I'm, not, I'm but, not subscribing to that either. Well, yeah. but I, I want to get into that. But you guys are both taking this conversation very seriously. So like, I mean, sorry, not very seriously, very personally. You can tell by what they say, like, there's a lot of reflection of identity. There's a lot of, I'm this, I'm that, I'm this, I'm that. Um, which is bound to create a, a more uh, <laughs> disagreeable discourse. It's interesting to watch. But I talk to a lot of people who make video games, right? And the most common thing I hear from people who make video mm -hmm. games is this sense of, like, like, just resounding apathy and burnout and just this sense that like people just want to leave the video game industry and that's not entirely because of this outrage thing but outrage is certainly a factor i mean other there are other reasons layoffs and uh crunch and underpay and all sorts of other issues that are all just part of the, that can all be single-handedly traced to these executives at big game right. publishers but the outrage, I think, is very real and is a very real problem. And I think that's something that that people like you and I need to be a little concerned about and think about when we are talking to people is like, what is this coming from? Is it necessary? What sorts of effects is it having on people beyond these like short-term victories, quote unquote, like Battlefront 2 changing its ways? What sorts of net long-term effects is this outrage going to have? And that's something that really deeply concerns Right. Me. Well, first of all, we are angry. I am angry because I had much more passion for games that I, when I play them 10 years ago than I do. Caught me mid-mouthful, but I want to talk about what Jason said. <clears throat> Short-term victories, quote-unquote, like Battlefront 2 changing its ways. What sorts of net long-term effects is this outrage going to have? And that's something that really deeply concerns Right. Me. Well, first of all, we are... Long-term effects of gamer rage. I don't think about that for a second. Not being taken seriously. Like Boy Who Cried Wolf. I could see that. Well, there are long term effects. We we'll have to think about it. Are angry? I am angry because I had much more passion for games that I, when I play them ten years ago than I do now. I remember when I used to look forward to the Assassin's Creed, the Star Wars Battlefronts, and all these different franchises. And now every time I go into E3 and look forward to an EA conference, I'm thinking, what's the catch? 
Congratulations, Yang Ye. You've become a sophisticated consumer of video games. Congratulations on growing up. Like that's that's the my my train of thought right now. And here's the thing, consumers, you have so much knowledge on uh, insider knowledge and what goes on and why things work the way they do. Consumers don't have that. And the, you know, you know, uh, and well, they could. I, I think one of the reasons that some people don't have it is because they don't want to learn. And uh, no, they to do. Be frank, but I think but, one but of the game companies that... can communicate better. I think this. Oh, this is such a great conversation. Jason is like. You want competence? Go get it. Yang Yang is like, why aren't they giving me understanding? This is such a, like, different stages of life conversation. Um, and if you're a Yang Ye, if you're a younger person, your job is to, like, try stuff, figure out what life is like, the way the world works. And he's asking, why doesn't the world work this way? Like, and it's a fair question to ask. Jason's at a stage of his life where he's kind of, he's got an understanding of the way the, the way the world works that means he can find his way in it. And he's wielding that in, the, in what he does. And his point of view is, I figured it out. Why aren't y'all figuring it out? Um, super, super interesting. I love this conversation. It's just that there's can, such a disparity course. in communication and yeah. it's oh yeah 100%. maddening no i i'm totally with you there i mean i think mm -hmm. games pr and marketing teams and the way that they communicate with people is just infuriating mm -hmm. i've railed against all sorts of right. companies for their terrible communication in various mm -hmm. ways but um there is a level of knowledge out there that i think you you your average gamer could certainly of course reach. um and i actually think that and this is not pointing fingers at you but mm -hmm. i do think that one of the problems is that a lot of youtube videos are very much in like designed in a way where it's someone talking about things, sometimes talking about things they don't really understand, making guesses, maybe reading things they saw on Reddit, <laughs> and kind of spreading this level of misinformation. And I think that's a real problem. Um, when you say that you're angry, I find that really interesting because uh, didn't we just agree that video games are in this great place? I mean, I, I, I get you on like like EA conferences uh, uh, are the most, I mean, I cover, I run our news team for Kotaku, mm -hmm. so we have to cover all the yeah, news sure. that comes out of them. And EA's conferences might be like the most terrifying, like terrible, like boring. Yeah. Oh my God. I mean, I can't believe they turned Command and Conquer into mm -hmm. a mobile game. Mm -hmm. Like that bummed me out. Mm -hmm. um, that they feel like they're designed for investors. But mm -hmm. I mean, that is like, uh, <laughs> that is a capitalism problem. That is a publicly traded company problem where these executives at the right. top are making right. many millions of dollars in order yeah. to make this stuff. Um, and I, 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 I get you. Um, but for me, I mean, I find it hard to get angry about these things because I'm looking at my Steam desktop right now, like I'm on my, my desktop right now, and I'm looking at these the, all these shortcuts to games that right. well, I cannot wait to play. I'm looking at what Star Wars Battlefront 2 could have been and what it ultimately wasn't. That's what I'm looking at, because I love Star Wars, but we're not going to get a proper Battlefront 2 because, well, EA fucked that up, didn't they? Um, and similar, you know, yeah, I've, I've got my... my uh, my, my game franchises that that are still on course. The red games like Red Dead Redemption Two, phenomenal. God of War, my personal game of the year. Uh, all these different games, yeah, and they remind me. Oh my God, yeah, this is why I love games. But then I see other franchises owned by these other companies take a certain course. You know, even if it's inching or if it's just swerving all the way through. And I'm thinking what that could have been, and 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 just the lack of 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 listening to the community. And I understand that, that it's not as simple as that, that there are sort of financial elements that they have to meet you know, financial guidelines and all that, but there has to be a better balance. Yeah. Notice that Jason is focused on what gamers create, what they give back, what they contribute to the overall discourse. And Yang Ye is focused on what games give him. Neither of them are wrong, but they care about different things in this argument. Games should be better. Gamers should be better. Um, I agree with both. That's why this is so interesting. Don't you agree? Mm -hmm. 
Like, yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, I think actually Diablo Immortal. Let's segue to Diablo Immortal because sure, yeah. I think that's a perfect example yeah. of this. And yeah, I mean, you look at that and you look at the anger and rage. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of that anger is misguided. And I think a lot of that anger only exists because of Blizzard's terrible mm-hmm. marketing and PR strategy yeah. and the yeah. fact that they decided to end the BlizzCon keynote on that game, which is mm-hmm. inexplicable to me. Yeah, same. Um, and so what I had heard and reported, as mm-hmm. I know that you saw, yes. is that they were planning on announcing Diablo 4. Blizzard has disputed that. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know for a fact that they made this video where Alan Adam, the executive vice president or whatever his title mm-hmm. is, talks about like, hey, we have this new Diablo. We have new Diablo games in the works. And they've hinted very strongly that they have Diablo 4 in the works. They do. I can tell you that mm-hmm. for a fact. Yeah. Um, but the fact that they are so like like sticking to the script for PR and marketing, like we can not talk about this game until right. it's ready to talk about. Right. And the fact that they couldn't even say, mm-hmm. like, yeah, Diablo 4 is in development, that is just them Baffling. just shooting themselves in both yeah. feet at once. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's <coughs> orienting their communication towards the, the shareholders rather than towards the gamers. Which is another conversation altogether. Publicly held, publicly traded game studios. Fucking UCDPR. All that said, it's like to to get so angry because Blizzard made a phone game that is clearly meant to mm-hmm. p- make money in China is that also seems like just I, I I can't understand it because not every game that Blizzard makes is going to be for me and I've accepted mm-hmm. that a long time ago. I don't play Heroes of the Storm. I have no interest in that game. Sure, and I'm probably not going to care about Diablo Immortal because like yeah. It, doesn't look great. Well, I think you're generalizing the crowd um, because not everyone is in the in the page of I want a Diablo Four. It's or rather like good point. Like they didn't necessarily he expect is Diablo Four, but so it's just you. that the the tone deafness that happened there is I think what mainly are people are angry about. I hear less people complaining about why wasn't Diablo Four shown. We wanted gameplay. We wanted a trailer. <laughs> it was less that and more of a how did you think that. Like you said at first, like it's baffling that this is a case of like again, I think the simple message being amplified. Like Blizzard destroyed Diablo to make a to gate to make a mobile game. Like it's an easy message. It's an easy idea. It repeats itself. It also sustains an image of of Blizzard that is increasingly corporate and out of touch. And we know. But like shareholder communications that Blizzard is like has a mandate to give all of its IPs mobile representations. Um, I think in this case, like gamer rage might have some utility. Shine a light on that shit because Blizzard did not build its empire on the back of fucking cell phones. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they didn't even build it on the back of console games. It was PC gamers. They're your core audience. They're the ones who show up to BlizzCon. Do you not have phones? Do you remember uh, the Fallout 4 announcement? Where they talked about Fallout 4 and they said, by the way, here's Fallout Shelter. You can play it on your phone right now. You remember like all the goodwill that generated? Because the game wasn't instead of what people wanted. It was like an enhancement to it. And, um, I mean, that was well handled. So why was it so tone deaf? Interface will have a response. This kind of, this level of communication and the, from what I hear at least from, and that's sort of what I, the information that I presented, I don't care that a mobile Diablo game exists. I just think the tone deafness of this BlizzCon and with everything that's going on right now, it paints this perception, and perception is such an important thing that are they losing their way, you know? And perhaps that's not, uh, that's it's too premature to say something like that, absolutely. But when Blizzard presents themselves that way, and when the, the next day it's more about mobile, all of our IPs are working on mobile. And that, I know that doesn't necessarily mean that we are not gonna get Diablo 4 and, or, or that it's gonna detract from that, but I mean, when that's the the focus of the conversation at a celebration event, uh, a fan event like BlizzCon, I mean, yeah, I th- I think you know the 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 quote I have here is this an out of season April Fool's joke? Mm-hmm. 
You know, for me, not an unreasonable thing to ask uh, at all. So, okay, so here is where we get into the point that I wanted to make. Sure. So, do you know who Wyatt Chang is? The guy who was on stage. The principal when designer. Us? Yeah. So, Wyatt Chang, um, I don't know him. I've interviewed mm -hmm. him once, but I don't really know him as a person. Mm -hmm. But I know that he has been working on Diablo for something like 15 years. Mm -hmm. He was involved in Diablo Damn. 3 all the way through its mm -hmm. like development hell, and he was on that project for a mm -hmm. very long time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What I've heard. From people at Blizzard, and this is secondhand, so sure. take that with, sure, with, sure. with whatever grains of salt you need, is that he, after Diablo 3, wanted a break. And I think that's the sense you get from a lot of people at Blizzard. Mm -hmm. They wanted a little break from these 10-year development hell cycles, right? Mm -hmm. So he says, mm -hmm. you know what? What can I do that would be a really a much shorter development cycle? It might take a couple of years or like a year instead of 10 years, right? Mm -hmm. So he goes to a mobile game because that's the answer to that question sure. is if you want to do shorter projects, you make mobile games, right? And it happens to be that Blizzard wants to team up with NetEase and make this game for China and mm -hmm, works mm -hmm. out nicely. Wyatt Chang, the poor guy, is put on stage yeah. and, like to represent this game yeah. after years and years of hard work making that's things sad. that Diablo fans love. Mm -hmm. He is forced to heart. stand on stage and yeah. take these questions from this guy. And I get it. I get that this guy like and and the, the Blizzard fans, this is all they had to talk to. They can't be like sending emails to Bobby Kotick. Mm -hmm. But like why can't they be talking about the people at Activision who are taking home? Bobby Kodak's bonus last year was, I believe, $28 million. Wyatt Chang yeah. is not making that kind of money. Yeah, for sure. Um, if but Wyatt Chang is a the guy they put up there, Jason. And <clears throat> this whole story he's telling about Wyatt wanting a break and the mobile game lining up is a story that Blizzard could have told us, too. Like, these bits of context that Jason has, like... They're great to have. And if you're a journalist, you know how to get them. But the average consumer, the average consumer is not going to have those kinds of insights. I didn't even know those things. And I think I'm a pretty sophisticated consumer of this kind of stuff. Um, and people cannot withhold judgment forever. I think... Jason is maybe proposing people should withhold their judgment a little longer than they do, which I think is probably good wisdom for us all. Although I think perhaps he could take a little bit of his own advice by not judging gamers as overly rageful. I, I actually wonder if like the real response to Jason's complaint is not about, is not to do with people. It's to do with the mediums. How do we communicate? And how, what kind of signals are amplified through those communications? Social media, Reddit, um, Twitter, YouTube. I like YouTube a lot. I've been liking, I, that, that's why I put my stuff there. Because it actually is a place where you can go for long form examination. Which is obviously what I'm doing. Look at this timeline. Um, <clears throat> but you can't really get it at Twitter. And Reddit is tends to be antagonistic to long form examination of anything. Unless it's one of those standout examples that's just presented in an immaculate way that the average person can easily ingest. Um, a lot of things we're touching, these guys are touching on. It, it, it just feels so misguided. It feels like, and by the way, that April Fool's joke, a lot of people have been like, like blasting me because I tweeted that that April Fool's joke was, like, was like uh, petulant and whatever. Yeah, yeah. petulant. Mm -hmm. um, people act like, again, it's the Twitter problem. Mm -hmm. People look at that tweet and they're like, oh my God, look at Jason's thoughts mm -hmm. etched in mm -hmm. zone. He's defending Blizzard without actually like reading or listening to anything I'm actually Blizzard. saying about Diablo Immortal. So mm -hmm. that's too bad. But because, like, I don't think this was a big deal. It was a stupid joke. I thought it was dumb and immature, but I don't really care that much about this guy asking a question on stage. Well, you, but you I replied to one that... user. You basically told him, like, like if, if you think this is okay, you can, like, fuck off. And Yeah, I mean, that's a problem with Twitter is that sometimes you'll be, like, angry about something, and then 20 minutes later you'll be like, oh, whatever, I don't care anymore. And he's denying responsibility for saying something. That's a little weak, Jason. Um but he is pointing out that it is a platform type issue, which actually reinforces what I just suggested. So I do appreciate that. But um, you, I don't, I don't think it's fair to say to hold gamers account individually accountable for their their rage, but not hold himself accountable for his own rage. Just be just a double standard that he should probably pay attention to.
anymore, but it's still etched in stone for everyone to see that you said fuck off to someone. Mm-hmm. And I, I mean, that's that's a problem and maybe something I should be better at dealing mm-hmm. with, but, that, but that's another story. Sure. Um, the point that I was trying to make is that like when people get this mad about Blizzard and Wyatt Chang and even just the idea of Blizzard, why aren't people sending mass letters to Bobby Kodak? Why aren't people Give us his r- email. Letters? Give us his email address. Why don't you send... Why don't, why don't, where's the letter mailing campaign to Activision Letter mailing, HQ Jason? Saying that... What are you yeah, talking about? This isn't the, the 90s? The CEO of Activision mm-hmm. making a $28 million <laughs> bonus based yeah. on the profit that he's generating from these ridiculous microtransactions for sure, for and sure. revenue streams. I think that that oftentimes, like, that's what makes me angry. Mm-hmm. I want to talk sure. about anger. Sure, it doesn't make sure. me angry that Blizzard's making Diablo Immortal. It makes me angry course, that Bobby the, Kodak the article is making writer. 20, yeah. eight million dollar bonuses while his employees are writing. like crunching their asses off to make games for him. <laughs> Hell yeah, and yeah. That I think, I mean, really, yeah. <laughs> what, what, <laughs> exactly. what a lot of people might not even realize is that they're angry at just like capitalistic structures yeah, in much, general. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. But yeah, I mean, that's what really is like, like, I don't know, I, maybe I just feel like the rage is misguided. Mm-hmm. Maybe I just feel like the rage is, is maybe I've gotten too old and I just don't understand. Sure. Be aware of your own rage, People too. can get so mad when there's uh-huh. so many great video games. I, I think it's a lot of things for me. No, I, 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 I see what you mean uh, from that perspective. But I think from the gamers, I, I think the reason they're so kind of um, sometimes direct and anger at you is because it, it feels like uh, you're you're basically telling gamers to fuck off and then when when the companies do stuff like battlefront like 2 one person to fuck off okay yeah yeah but not. but but you know like uh calling this man who basically asked a question at a Q&A panel that yeah it was rude but i personally don't think it was petulant i think it, it was an expression of i'm baffled and i it think was petulant, in a public... but it wasn't a big deal i sure. mean i think that that like i mean i don't care that much about this guy and what he yeah. said i just thought he was no yeah expre- but he was mm-hmm. just Rub me the wrong way. Sure, sure. Uh, but my point is, it, I guess it for some gamers, it feels like the gamers rub you in the wrong way. But these, it's yep. like when when you talk about like the Battlefront two loot boxes, it, it almost feels like you just give him a a tap on the wrist, say they could do better, and then but with the gamers, it's like, oh, you guys are acting like fools or immaturely. It's a good point, Helen. It feels uh, just from what's Imbalanced. out there. It feels very skewed. Like it, it's I like think there's it more. That way to there's more anger towards actually... the gamer than there is towards the the corporations and the or the the some of the game business models. What you got, Jason? Yeah, I mean, I think people who would see things that way just don't actually follow my work and maybe just saw a Yang Ye video. Uh, so I follow Jason's work and I agree with Yang on this. But that was about one of my tweets because. But, I mean, Jason does really hold gaming companies tremendously accountable. Um. I guess it, maybe it's a channel issue. Like he uses his professional work to hold game games accountable, and he uses his social media to hold gamers accountable. So if you if you don't see both sides of it, it seems imbalanced. Maybe that that's a fair defense. Um, think about it. Anyone who follows my work knows that for years and years I have been. Uh, just railing against corporations for all sorts of reasons, for especially for the way that they treat the people who work for them, the way that the crunch system, the the way that crunch practices just destroy people, just chew them up and spit them out. Um, I've written, I mean, I yeah, wrote no, a book of course. about this. No, I, I know all about that. Yeah. Your times. I mean, so, so I mean, I, I, I think that anyone who follows my work would see how preposterous it is to think that I defend corporations in any way. I do think that it's important to look at these things and... <coughs> the way he keeps bringing up rage, didn't he just answer the question a bit by talking about the medium it expressed in a lot of social media bang, bandwagoning? Yep. Yep. He did. He did. And so, yeah, I think he kind of gave a partial answer to his own question, maybe without being 100% aware of it. Um, but it's hard to focus your rage on systems like social media, uh, platforms because, I mean, it's just like a big, a big complicated thing. And, um, yeah, the hard thing is like, if you're a person who can acknowledge that there are problems in, on all sides of, of, of a system, but you choose, you choose to single out one part of the system with one of your communication channels, then it's easy to be painted as a defender of whoever is on the other side of that. Um, so it, it, it's, it's odd that he would be in social media painted as a 
a, 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 a an apologist to game publishers, but uh, in his actual work, he's quite an, quite an assassin of publishers. It is quite a a dialectic to wonder, like, hey, how did these decisions get made? Why are these yeah, decisions sure. getting made? How can I advance the conversation in a productive way? Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think the answer to that is the sheer rage and posting in your YouTube comments about cucks and SJWs and all the other things that I Why do I people do seen. that anyway? Yeah, it's, well, yeah. It's, with YouTube comments. Yeah, I don't no, disagree I... with you there. Um, but at the same time, when you, you're not helping by just going out there and calling a guy who was baffled petulant or by by making it seem like you're this I mean, guy he was petulant. I'm, I'm not gonna I disagree. take that back and we can disagree on that sure. but again it's not a i don't think it's a big deal that this guy was like mm -hmm. this this dude was like said something obnoxious I right mean, but you you're at very the end angry. of the day it doesn't matter yeah. that much mm -hmm. unless but if you're like uh, what what i think about is if if you are Wyatt Chang and mm -hmm. you have just like put out, put, been put out there by your company mm -hmm. and just taken all this this abuse, and mm -hmm. now I bet when people Google his name, like this is the first thing that comes up yeah, instead sucks, of years yeah. and years of hard work. Mm -hmm. um, I just see that happen constantly, yeah, and for sure. I see people. I just hear I hear people who are talented, experienced game developers saying, "What am I doing? Like, why am I mm -hmm. working for these people who seem to hate me?" Mm -hmm. And I think there it, there's a reputation and there's a feeling um, for but like whether this is true or not but there is a feeling among the people who make video games that they are making games for an audience that detests them and is just looking for any reason to watch there them is. fail mm -hmm. that's and that's the kernel of jason's truth right there i think that's a real problem but, and i think that mm -hmm. that's something that people like you could do to alleviate that is to make sure that everything that you say and I say and all of us say who mm -hmm. are in these positions mm -hmm. where we have platforms is comes from a place that is accurate and true and fair and that last word is especially important fair um, for example something that I think is very unfair is taking Mark Dara who's the producer of Anthem mm -hmm. and taking his interview from that was like a lighthearted game informer interview mm -hmm. where he talks mm -hmm. about Mass Effect Andromeda a game that he didn't even work on and says that he answers a question like do you think that got a fair shot and he says no because it was really the same month at zelda i think taking that and like attacking him over it feels very unfair to me because here's this guy who is representing his other game is not involved with that with mass effect and drama at all is asked a question answers that question in the best way that he thinks he can and then is suddenly seen as the face of like everything wrong with bioware i recently did some research into a, uh, a philosophy, an idea. I'm not sure how you'd characterize it necessarily. Um, but it's, it, it's the idea that the medium is the message. And it's proposed by uh, some guy whose name I can't remember. And, but his argument is basically like, okay, he was making this argument. The context was he was doing like a like a like a, a Q and A on television. I can't remember what the context was, but he was a white man standing in a suit giving a Q and A on television. And his argument that he made is essentially that ninety percent of the meaning that is transmitted by what he says comes from the fact that comes from what he looks like, what he wears the set that you're seeing him on on TV, the fact that he's on a TV screen, all these things have nothing to do with what he's saying. And the argument is basically that people are unaware of the staggering amount of information that gets transmitted through indirect channels when we communicate. And they're channels of oftentimes about identity. Um... And it's a way of thinking about why someone who works at a game studio putting up a reasonable, rational defense of a game that did gamers wrong, 
it was a sequel to a beloved IP that, by all accounts, just missed the mark on a bunch of different levels. What he's doing is he's aligning himself with something people don't like, and he's defending it. And he's also, by the way he phrased it, he's informally comparing it to Zelda. And th what that does is it suggests that people who don't like it only don't like it because it's not as good as Zelda, which is like one of the greatest games of all time. Um, and so he didn't say those things. He didn't say that, that Andromeda ranks up there with, with, uh, with Zelda, Breath of the Wild. He didn't say that. He didn't say that he supported the game. He didn't say that he liked it. Um, he has to have got a fair shake. But people simplify, and they take into effect the context cues. And I think that there's actually a lot of utility behind people doing that, the reason people do that. And it's got to do with just simple expediency. Um, words are this immensely deep thing. <laughs> Here, as I sit spewing many, many words... So sensory implication isn't isn't is what is what what's a driving force rather than actual information. Well, I think what it does is it recognizes the corporeal nature of our being, which is to say that yes, I think that there's this temptation to view information in this dispassionate way and communication in like this purest fashion, like zeros and ones. But the fact is, we experience information through our mortal coil, through our eyes and ears and our our bodies and um. And we're and we are humans are social beings that are configured evolutionary. I shouldn't say configured, that that have evolved to read social cues, and we can't help it. We cannot, we cannot flip and help, but to constantly read social cues. And it's what helps us know how to know how to behave in certain situations. They're they're very useful. Um. And what. We're, what we're running into in the modern age is we have more ability than ever to play with identity and to play with association. And because we can see so many more people than we used to be able to see, like it feels like when we're across the screen from someone, like maybe we can see them. You can know them. Like you can see me now. Maybe you have an assumption about the way my life is, how I feel, um, anything like that. But it's not the same as being in the room. And we are still figuring out how the hell to deal with this. You're the most interesting man in the world. Well, thank you. Oh, thank you, one third soon. <laughs> the money is on the way. Uh, anyway, the medium is the message. It's not like uh, an answer to a problem. It's just like a reminder that I keep back here. Um that what I'm communicating isn't only what I'm saying. And it's a very useful reminder to know how to behave in certain situations. Because sometimes the thing I can say in a pure informational sense can be correct, appropriate, and unassailable. But the way that the context, the contextual parameters around that communication may, can make it offensive or can make it um, mean something completely different. Um, it's a very hard thing to wrangle with. We all do. And I think that there's a temptation to deny it. And, um, we'll see how these two gentlemen interact with it. I think that that is the type of thing that I think winds up turning a lot of game developers off, making a lot of people feel like, oh my God, there's just so much anger and <laughs> hatred in this mm -hmm. industry. Yeah. And I just feel like, like, I don't want to tell you how to do your job, but I do feel like it's really important for people like us to just feel the sense of responsibility. And don't get me wrong, I fuck things up all the time. Sure, yeah. I do not, mm -hmm. I am not perfect in any way. I, I get things right. wrong constantly. But I think that just trying to hold yourself to certain standards when it comes to that and just not be part of the problem when it comes to this outrage, um, I think is important. Yeah, for sure. Uh, but consequently, I, I think. 
when game journalists just sort of generalize gamers as these, you know, like, oh, these angry animals or whatever. Because, um, yeah, I, I know that you did write these articles for uh, against some of these corporations and these practices, but they're very mm-hmm. succinctly put. You talk, it's very meticulous and uh, you, you go into a lot of detail. But then when you look at a guy who you know, ask the question at a Q&A panel, it's he's petulant, period. That's it. There's no, you, you don't, you don't give any sort of additional articulation on that front. Whereas with these issues, you kind of look at every angle. And then with the gamers, it's like, they're just petulant or they're just entitled. Yeah, or, I mean, or, I think or somebody problem, else said that, I don't know. Well, I mean, you're just, when you look at a tweet versus actual reporting. Yeah, but, but stories, a tweet matters. A it does matter. Like in the same way that your articles are looked at, so are your tweets. It's a public forum. The wisdom of the young. Yang's right. Jason's Jason's not giving enough credence to to the the me, to the the meaning of what he transmits via via Twitter. And Yang is telling him, "Hey man, like this matters too." It's a good it's a good moment. No, yeah, yeah, I tweet I has I mean, don't get me wrong. No, no, no. Well. Don't get me wrong. Twitter is the worst thing ever invented. <laughs> I mean, I I, I I I see what you're saying. Uh-huh. And yeah, I mean, that's something that I have to reckon with uh-huh. is realizing that when I tweet a stray thought on the subway, I actually wrote that tweet like uh-huh. while I was just looking at videos on the subway and uh-huh. just watching it. I was like, "Oh my god, this is stupid." Um I I have to realize that that is Mm-hmm. given the same weight as what mm-hmm. I published on Kotaku to a certain level subject, a uh, subset of my audience. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I totally understand that. Um, but, but I do think that, that even though there's like suddenly this, this perspective mm-hmm. and I think it's some, it's a lot of it comes from your audience that I am this corporate chill who's defending Blizzard and defending, uh, uh, what was the other one? Uh, Ubisoft for Assassin's Creed Odyssey and, and like, uh, and then the Bethesda thing, the Bethesda right. engines thing. I think that 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 perspective is just so out of whack, especially I, the Bethesda thing. I don't disagree. Um, considering they have haven't talked to me in five years, um, but I think I, I I've been thinking about like why that is and how that came about, and I think a lot of it is people just seeing my tweets or seeing a single article without mm-hmm. being familiar with my body of work, and I I totally understand that. I don't expect everyone to mm-hmm. just be like researching every single thing that I've sure. written. Right. Um, I I think that what maybe what what some people aren't understanding and maybe what uh, a point that i wanted to bring up to you mm-hmm. is that i don't really see like like everything i do is to serve my audience whether mm-hmm. it is people who are hardcore video gamers who check kotaku every single day check my twitter feed every single mm-hmm. day whatever it is or people who are casual mm-hmm. gamers or people who don't care about games and just like reading kotaku for mm-hmm. whatever reason my job is to serve every single one of those people it is like like that is what i do every day for a full time job that is i go to my office and write things and report and do things that are serving those people so like i don't feel the need to get on a soapbox and be like gamers rights consumers stand up because i feel like everything i am doing is for those people i my job is to entertain and inform those people right. so i guess i just see this yeah. in a different light than sure. other people might like i i don't really think that i need to be like standing up for the gamers no I, um, but i think you you need to address them as equals and not just as these ah oh, these these guys these these um you know like it, because that's what it feels well, like. When, Even if it's not your intention, it does. When uh, when did it feel that way? Other than the calling the dude petulant. I mean, there is a uh, multi. I, I can't think of it right now, but there were yeah, multiple. Yeah, I mean, I I I I think that I see what you're saying, mm. and I think that it can come across that way maybe when you're looking at it from a perspective of like i'm one of you i'm gonna get mad and share all your theories and read reddit posts and that sort of thing as opposed to like hey here i'm in a position and this is something that i take very seriously but i'm an i am in a position where i can talk to people and get answers to questions that your average Mm -hmm. audience not and i take that really seriously and think it's really important and i mean if people see that as me standing on a high horse because i felt like it needed to be explained what a game engine actually is because no, that you no, were no, that was, misused yeah. i mean that that's like something that people were saying they're like oh my god look at this jason being sanctimonious here right i think that's ridiculous <sighs> gotta let young get a word in edgeways man um jason here i think might be presuming earned trust on the part of some of his audience. Um, the idea that 
I should be able to speak freely because my actions speak for themselves is a form of um, moral self-licensing. It's like the idea that, like, it's okay if I throw my fast food garbage bag out on the highway because I'm a good person and I donate to church and I volunteer at the homeless shelter. Um, it's excusing your it's excusing immoral acts by by having a moral identity. And it's one of the convenient lies that we tell ourselves when we just want to like deny an argument, like, like just stop. Like I'm, I'm, I'm a good person. I do good things. I'm, I'm, I'm with gamers. Like I'm a gamer. I, I fight for what's right in gaming. I should be able to speak freely and maybe you should, but I don't think he should probably be, be treating Twitter that way. And I think that he's he's probably, and I, hopefully he has in the years since this interview, but it seems to me that Jason is not giving Twitter the, um, not giving Twitter enough respect. No, respect isn't the right word. He's treating it kind of like a bar with his friends. Where you just kind of cheese off. But that's not the way everyone's treating it. And I think he's not making himself seem to like aware of that enough. Um, he's not respecting that reality. Once it's Zoom, but I confessed my sins last week in church, officer. You can't arrest me for fondling that <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> exactly. More also licensing. It's a it's a trap we it, anyone can fall into. I mean, I think it's my job to. I I think also I I feel compelled to point out like a lot of what I'm hearing in this conversation is what I think maybe could be classified as like. Well, no, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep that idea in the back of my head. If if it gets confirmed, I'll bring it back later try to explain things sure. to my audience. Yeah. And I think that uh, people who read Kotaku, the millions of readers that we have, know and appreciate that. And I guess what I would say to your audience is, if you really feel like I am anti-gamer, I am no. for you to read my body I of never, work. I never, ever, I don't know if uh, you actually, I've never said that, in fact. Uh, no, in I know, you're very video. complimentary of me, and I appreciate that. But I have certainly seen what your audience says. Right, no, of course, but, YouTube you know, and consequently, your audience audience when you, you stop know, reading the comments say, Jason. you know the youtube that's what Joe Rogan would yeah say. consequently they come to me and say you're the alex jones of a video game news essentially no that's ridiculous right but I, but I see I, that... I, I, unfortunately this is i well i yeah, hate that well, it is yeah, this way me, it is internet say, culture just, yeah but i want to say i i mean i did not call you a provocateur like like willy-nilly like i chose sure. that word deliberately and i think that what you do and i have a lot of respect for the the strives you made you've made as a mm -hmm. youtube video i've been watching your videos for a long right. time i have a lot of respect for you i i think you work very hard i think you do some really good stuff but i also think that when you make videos that do provoke people and i think a lot of your videos are designed that way or at least they're packaged that way because i think you speak very calmly and rationally and oftentimes you try to present things in a really rational way but when you make videos that have certain inflammatory titles and then when they say certain inflammatory things or even just ask questions that might come from a place of bad information I think that winds up provoking people and stoking the flames of outrage in Big a way true. that I think Big is true. is can can be very dangerous. And I'm not telling you this because I think you should quit and, and go live on a farm in Utah. I think that I, I'm telling you this and I'm on your show because mm -hmm. I think that having constructive criticism can just sure. make us all better. Absolutely. Um, for an example, and, and I want to bring up the example that we were talking about on Twitter yeah, because yeah. I feel like just tweeting about it was yeah, I mean, Twitter is a garbage website. It's yeah. not a good place to have a conversation. Right. Um, I, when you said, when you asked that question, like, is it 
is it possible that uh, I'm paraphrasing? I don't have it in front of me. Sorry, but is it possible that Blizzard making Diablo Immortal is detracting from their other games? I know that you were just asking the question that a lot of fans are asking, mm -hmm. but I think when you're in a position when you're speaking to hundreds of thousands of people, doing that is the same as as as, as spreading misinformation. It's like saying. Uh, not that I think you're anything like Alex Jones, but it's as if Alex Jones were on his video saying, I'm just asking questions. Was Obama born in America? We don't right. know. I'm just ask Woof. Okay. When I was in 10th grade, I was taking a, a class on U.S. history. And the big part of that class was essay writing. Um, it's actually where I learned to write a persuasive essay and how to make persuasive arguments. It was a fantastic class taught by a brilliant teacher and I really respect um, and, uh, I had a couple big problems in that class. So one of them was my horrific handwriting. Um, so when I was a kid, I learned to write in block letters like everyone else did. I was in third grade. I spent one year at a school that mandated that I write in cursive. So I learned how to do that. But then after I got after I came back out of that school, I started writing in block letters again. And from that moment on, my handwriting was atrocious. I couldn't write in cursive well. I couldn't write in block letters well. It was just awful. And something that this teacher said, this brilliant teacher said in one of my essays, is, I know this is like the pot calling the kettle black, but you really must improve your handwriting. And it was a piece of criticism that was offered with such levity and such self-reflection I still, I still remember it to this day, and it actually really, I took it seriously. Um, and I wish that Jason would show a little bit more self-reflection of the things he's accusing Young of in that similar way. He's, is, he's talking about how Young is use intentionally or not his platform to stoke anger but denies his own role in stoking anger through his own channels because as he justified twitter is a garbage website hey repair thanks for the resub man pot calling to kettle black a little bit that's in question but it come on, like there's a repeated pattern of certain things happening i mean companies who get a taste of the lucrative nature of mobile you know will either shift towards more mobile games or even model their triple a games after mobile i'm not pulling things out of thin air i'm not saying 9-11 no, no, was a yes. conspiracy trust me i i hear you and you're totally right and i think that like based on my reporting and uh uh just a little bit of a teaser i have been reporting a lot on diablo immortal and what's going on with diablo mm -hmm. and you should expect an article in the near sure. future about all that stuff all right. but but based on my reporting trust me we have reasons that like there are questions to ask about blizzard that mm -hmm. is for sure mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. activision's influence on blizzard the fact that their ceo just left their well-respected right, right. beloved ceo there are a lot of questions to be asked don't get me wrong but i think you have have to ask them from a position of of education and not just stoking like what people are believing on reddit and not just like conveying the common misconceptions and i think that one of them is like oh well they said they have all their best people working on mobile games that's not entirely true i mean first of all uh i think that when alan adams said that he was saying it as a kind of one of those expressions where it's like oh yeah we have some of our best people our doing man, it. not the literally case. like we have our best developers of the company doing mm -hmm. this because that's not <laughs> i mean that's that would be ridiculous for him to say it's insulting to the rest of it people it was more of a turn of phrase but second of all i think that what you like what you might not know and i don't expect you to know this but blizzard has an incubation team and that is where their mobile games are coming out of and it's very different from their team one team two team three starcraft mm -hmm. team diablo mm -hmm. team etc um they're just totally different structures so mm -hmm. them doing diablo immortal just by definition is going to have nothing to do with their diablo right. 4 project and in fact since this video was published i think we learned if I'm correct, also via another Jason Schreier expose, that there is a new Diablo game that was being worked on by Team One, which was the team who created the Warcraft 3 Reforged debacle, which by all accounts was a debacle because it was rushed out via publisher decision, uh, not by that team's failure to do good work. And um, Activision just bought a studio 
whose name I cannot now recall, who was doing work with Blizzard. And uh, Blizzard has basically swallowed that, that that studio and assigned them to the task of making the new Diablo. And I guess they they killed the old Team 1, whatever. Uh, whatever happened there. But uh, <laughs> there's been some feels bad mans being exchanged around the gaming press about that. Um, future of Diablo is uncertain. Still. And I don't expect you to know that. But Why I can't they that... communicate that? During, because during the Q&A panel. Because, right, because that's what I mean. That's what well, I mean. Look, don't get me wrong. I mean, I've spoken about this. I've been writing about this for mm. years. If you actually, if you look back, maybe don't look back because I'm kind of embarrassed of, of this article <laughs> right. now, but I wrote something in 2012, actually, about how one of the biggest problems in gaming is that game developers aren't talking. And it's totally right. true that, like, uh, I mean, one of the reasons that I have to use anonymous sources constantly is because mm. all these people have signed NDAs and right. they can't talk about things. And that's, that's right. horrible. Yeah. And there's so many stories in games that we are just never going to uh -huh. hear because of these fucking NDAs. Yeah. But, uh, trust me, I'm as pissed off about that as anything. Mm -hmm. Like, talk about rage. That's what makes me angry. But <laughs> that said, I think that it is our position, and I know that you have the capability of doing stuff like this. It's, it's just our position in general. Mm -hmm. And don't get me wrong, it's not just you. It's like, I see this from regular journalists. I see this from all sorts of people on the internet just making up these theories or, like, mm -hmm. guessing and, mm -hmm. and speculating. Just it doesn't surprise me that Jason's a, like a dog with a bone. Like, I think to be an investigative journalist, it takes a certain personality type. And I think that, that, that what we're seeing that here, it's interesting to watch. Just based on nonsense. But it's our responsibility to just be like trying to find ways to actually answer those questions or at the very least asking questions that are from a more perf like informative perspective and asking these questions in a way that doesn't stoke outrage if we don't really know what the answers are. Um, I think it's really important to do that, especially when we have these huge platforms and we really just like owe something to our audience. We owe all the, we have this responsibility to our audience to make sure that they are For kept sure. informed yeah. and not just like, like allowing these opinions to keep spreading that are just totally off base. Um, the, I mean, the blizzard thing is just one example. I trust me. I've seen this from, to so many different people it is it, it just rubs me the wrong way when people are like just just looking for controversy after controversy and just looking for things to get mad about it and just that doesn't I'm mean looking it, for for respite from all this crap <laughs> is what i'm looking for uh yeah i mean I, i'm with you there like uh, like it like i i don't like it, it feels good to get this out because i f yeah like yeah, I do, I do make a lot of like, oh, is this what's happening? I, I don't understand. Like, what is going on? Um, and that's, yeah, it's not always uh, the healthiest thing to do. But it's just like, I don't know what else to say. Because uh, yeah. there is no communication. Uh, you know why CD Projekt Red, I think, is so, uh, like, like this will be few good. people, like, say shit about CD Projekt Red. Um, and that's because they communicate. They actually do that. I, there was one video posted by this YouTuber called Pretty Good Gaming, and he basically Ooh. kind of took a quote from they they took a quote from the from some investors meeting. Yeah. And they 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 kind of went, wait a minute, that sounds like there might be microtransactions or something in Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven. Um, and so that stoked, like, like as you said, and I'm not. This is not a diss, by the way. I'm just trying to, you know. Yeah, I remember this. Yeah, right. And and then they said. Um, yeah, like, like maybe there's microtransactions in Cyberpunk 2077. CD Projekt Red responded like the next day, saying, "Okay, here's here's what's what's happening with that," uh, and they they explained everything and they said, "But H in the end, like you know, we, we talk investors this way, but Cyberpunk 2077, no microtransactions is going to be like Witcher 3, free DLCs, the bite-sized DLCs, and big expansions. This same format, we can assure you. Boom, just like that, that outrage died." There was no more of that, and and it was just an an, uh, an immediate relief. Mm -hmm. Why can't more game companies do that? I, I, yeah, I guess in large part question, the publishers yeah. and the NDAs and whatever. Yeah, I mean the problem is that it's like these publicly traded companies. Example, I mean sometimes they will say that in I mean in Poland mm -hmm. there's no SEC rules. Mm -hmm. The SEC in America actually prevents what game publishers that are publicly mm -hmm. traded, EA and Activision, actually prevents what they can say sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, as far as like what's coming in the future, like sometimes right. they're literally legally prevented. Mm -hmm. But yeah, totally. I mean a lot of this is 
uh, I've been following the video game industry for a very long time. Mm-hmm. A lot of this mm-hmm. is just this, uh, these antiquated practices where it's mm-hmm. like it used to be back in the day, it was just like every single data point of a game was just like carefully doled out. It's like, okay, this month we're putting out the screenshots. This month we're telling everybody how many guns there mm-hmm. are in the game. And it was just this mm-hmm. so controlled. Um, and it's also it was also the point where, like, I mean, 30 years ago, it was just video game mm-hmm. magazines and they mm-hmm. just existed to sell Nintendo ads. Power. Wow. these games and mm-hmm. write previews right. and uh, just puff up everything and there mm-hmm. were some of them were literally run by game publishers like Nintendo Power and right. that <laughs> was a different world it's gotten much better now and I we've love gotten those to magazines, the point where though. there are journalists and outlets Myself. who are independent and they're mm-hmm. they're fighting the good fight, fight and making sure that these publishers are kept in check a little bit mm-hmm. um, and I think that's really important but to uh, some extent the PR people have not kept up with that right. and that's one of the reasons that Bethesda thinks it's okay to just blacklist an outlet for five years is because right. they believe in this world where they control mm-hmm. every single mm-hmm. game company or game outlet mm-hmm. and if the game outlet isn't behaving they, they gotta keep up is that a middle finger from Jason? Zoom, zoom in on that. Enhance. This is me post-processing doing the zoom. I'm not going to do that. I feel like these these guys are starting to get on the same page. I'm feeling less need to stop and like mediate. Like, uh, then this is what happens when you have a long conversation with someone. I love this shit. Like, Eventually, you start to, like, learn how to talk to each other and figure out where each other's coming from, and you can kind of forgive the initial jaggedy kind of communication and favor the kernel of truth that comes out. Um, I don't know. It's remarking at that. Microaggression. Yes. <laughs> keep them in line. They got to keep them away. Mm-hmm. Um so yes, I, I mean, you're 100% right. This idea of like this veil of secrecy over the video game industry mm-hmm. is one of the biggest problems. And mm-hmm. that's something that I've been trying to fight against for a very long right. time. It's one of the reasons that I, I, I do some of the things that I do and report some of the things mm-hmm. that I report. Um, but yeah, I mean... So you guys are just going to agree that secrecy is bad. So I'll, I'll put a, a brief retort. Um, <clears throat> I think that the most generous, like, the most generous way to present a point of view is to try to put it up against your best understanding of the best contradictory point of view. Um, So I'm going to do that here. A good reason to have secrecy in game development is because game development is a messy creative process. And communication begets expectation. The trick isn't to maintain perfect secrecy or perfect transparency. It's to find out where one is called for or the other. When communication was less powerful back in the Nintendo Power days, secrecy was easy. It was easy. In fact, anything but secrecy was hard to do. Things are tilting ever more in the opposite direction now. I just wanted to say that. Um, there is there is something to be said for having certain creative decisions and, and debates occur with small, controlled groups of people rather than the gaming public. And that's that said, there is there are rooms for these conversations and questions that can be asked that I think aren't don't contribute to the problems. I think there are ways to have these conversations and there are even ways to like get upset about things or get annoyed about things without just like turning it into outrage after outrage after outrage, fight after fight after fight. I mean, look, the, the Bethesda creation engine thing is actually a perfect example mm-hmm. because it's like this this whole conversation started based on a quote from June that was then taken by Forbes in an article about game engines and then rediscovered like two weeks after the Forbes mm-hmm. article. It was ridiculous. It was like this this harmless quote that was like, yeah, we've changed a lot and now we're we're keeping our editor, but mm-hmm. we've changed everything else. It's part of our engine. And it just turned into this just giant circle jerk of ignorance. And I get it. I get that it's because Fallout 76 just came out and it looks like garbage and it yeah. runs like gar- like yeah. jank. Um, <laughs> and it raises questions about Bethesda's yeah. technology. And I think those are legitimate questions. But to- Ah, so we have some new context about the Bethesda Fallout 76 thing. We now know that Bethesda is potentially being bought by Microsoft. I think we'll see a a legal decision made on that in coming weeks, I think. Um, <clears throat> and 
<clears throat> I saw it suggested somewhere, and it sounded pretty reasonable to me that Fallout 76 was the way it was because it was actually a bit of a cash grab because Bethesda was becoming cash poor. Um, and uh, which is why they were looking to partner with a big publisher like um, like Microsoft to just get some of that sweet cash to build their stuff. So hopefully if this does come through, it'll mean an end to Fallout 76 style games from Bethesda. And we can get back to making Skyrim and Morrowind and Oblivion. I guess all I cite is the Elder Scrolls because I'm not a big fan of Fallout in general. But yeah. Bit of, bit of context, yeah. To turn that into headlines, and this is not just you by any means, but to turn that into headlines that say Bethesda not changing its headline for uh, engine for Starfield and Elder Scrolls Six is just such nonsense. Like that is not a conversation that is worth Hell having. Yeah. The conversation that is worth having is like, why is this game so buggy? How did this happen? Is this should this be called early access? Uh, should this be a $60 game right now? Should this be something that we spend our money on? We should play it and then talk about it and expose this. And I think it's super important for people like you to keep talking about it and exposing it and being like, look, look at these bugs. Look at mm. this bug that literally deletes the beta off of your right. machine. That is absurd. Yeah, how that's could this hilarious. Ever be public? Like, like, how could this be shipped? How could this be shipped mm -hmm. to people's computers? That is ridiculous, mm -hmm. right? It's important to have those conversations, but when you start talking about, like, like Starfield and the Elder Scrolls Six and how Bethesda is deciding for this game that won't come out till 2024, they're deciding now that they're not going to change their tech. Like, that's... If you think about that for even 30 seconds, it's it's preposterous. Like, <laughs> Elder Scrolls Six, it very well might have the same problems that other Bethesda games have, and I think there are many conversations to be had about like why those games have so many problems and and yeah. what the root causes of those are but to even talk about like what tech they have for elder scrolls 6 now is like professor like they haven't yeah. even decided but elder scrolls 6 still feels so far away it's funny i was actually going through my uh my mod list for my my skyrim playthrough just earlier today uh yeah, uh, sometimes, yeah, so the Microsoft thing seems like a bit of a cry for help. We have Starfield, we have Elder Scrolls. How are we ever going to get these things made? Help us. Microsoft is like, we got you. We got you. That That's the story that I would like to be true. Um, we'll just have to see. Um, sorry, I'm thinking about Skyrim now. <laughs> should get back to the boys when you look at again it's just there's such a repeated pattern of this if this were you know if fallout 76 were like a fluke then people wouldn't be saying anything but it's just from a, from morwen to oblivion to to uh, fallout 3 to skyrim each time oh um, yeah it's yeah, that's felt like true. you know so so when when that pattern keeps repeating itself and then, yeah, Todd Howard says something like, uh, like that. It, it, it's hard for people who've been like anticipating. Okay, when are we gonna get finally move forward? He's talking about the the self deprecating joke Todd made about there being bugs in their games. I'm not sure what I think about that. With the technology, it's hard for them to to, to wonder, or not to wonder. Are we going to just be stuck in this perpetual state of we're just going to keep getting buggy releases that are unacceptable at launch? Uh, the way like the way Fallout seventy six launched, unacceptable in my if you ask me. That I mean that's a good question, and I think it should be asked when Starfield comes out in twenty twenty or whatever it is. I mean I think to just to have that, that conversation nice. now is is premature and ridiculous because we don't even know what that game is. Like we don't know anything about it except for a title screen. I think it's more important to be looking at Fallout seventy six and be like, I mean the I, questions that I have lots of questions about that game. First of all, yeah. how did it chip the way it did? How does mm -hmm, mm -hmm. why why is this not an early access game? Mm -hmm. Why is this not right. a beta? Yeah. Why is this not like being 
I mean, I don't know. I haven't played a sure. session to talk too much about it, but sure. just based on what I've seen. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then the other question that people should be asking is like, why is, I haven't seen a lot of people talking about the fact that at the Video Game Awards in 2017, Bethesda's marketing team put out this video that was like, save single player. Mm -hmm. Look at us. We're making all these single player games. Mm -hmm. And then at E3 <laughs> this year, they announced Fallout 76 online game. They announced uh, Doom having, or, no, not Doom. It was Wolfenstein multiplayer, mm -hmm. Wolfenstein mm -hmm. multiplayer. Uh, a prey multiplayer mode. It was like all this multiplayer mm. stuff, and I, I haven't seen enough people calling out that hip hypocrisy. Wolfenstein, Jason. Wolfenstein. <laughs> Sir, what? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, hopefully this is all explained by what we talked about a minute ago. Bethesda just needing more money, more resources, and maybe they were grabbing at multiplayer as a a way to fuel microtransactions as a way to get more money in. I don't know. I don't know. There are many of the other hypocritical things that Bethesda does. Um, I think it's really important Wolf to keep talking Steve. about that and raising those things. Not necessarily to get angry about them, because again, I don't think outrage is really justified a lot of no, the time. No, but, but there is a room to express concern about the future, I think. Uh, sure, but to take a quote like that and extrapolate it to mean like Bethesda's not changing their ways. They're going to stick to their same old jankiness for these future games. We'll I mean, see. that to me is ridiculous. Like, yeah. I wonder if Jason is mistaking a competence problem for an intent problem. What's the saying is, do not attribute to malice what can be, can, what can be attributed to ignorance. I wonder if like the young yays of the world, and I'm not sure if young yay was actually part of this complaining meta or not i don't know um so i wonder if those folks just don't have the the nuance the competence to express what jason is saying the ability to raise interest without igniting flames because it's not simple to do that it's not simple to say i know there's a problem and i know the people and i know that it doesn't mean that you know Whoever's accountable for the problem is evil. Like, I'm looking at Yong, he's just like, I got nothing. And the sense that I read from that is like, Jason looks at him like a peer in this when perhaps he should be looking at him as someone who's still learning. When it comes to that, that kind of nuance. But, I mean, you're sitting across from each other in a video conference. It's respectful to treat each other as equals. Um, I'm not trying to say Young's not good at what he does. He is, like, he's, his, his success is undeniable. But I think that Jason holding Young to the same level of journalistic nuance that he holds himself to, although, let's be honest, selectively, apparently with Twitter, he just doesn't feel the need to be accountable at all. <clears throat> at least not when he recorded this um and you know the reason i wanted to look at this video is because of a few reactions that i saw and the reactions were all from young 20 something youtubers who all basically thought that jason was being a dick calling out gamers and young was kind of just like the heroic representative for gamers but that's not what i see i see a lot of things Fuck Twitter. Yeah, Jason Schreier. Uh, it's, 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 a. Uh, I mean, fuck Twitter is one of those like unnuanced, easy to understand ideas. It, it's, it's, a. Uh, you say fuck Twitter, but then you use it. It's, uh, it's contradictory. Like, in a way, it's some of the same stuff he's holy, he's complaining about with gamers. And that's where, uh, it's a little blind spot, at least at the time of this video. I like Twitter. It has its problems. In some ways, it's beautifully open, though. You know, you can post, like, hardcore pornography on Twitter and shit like that. It's crazy. Crazy what you can get there. Like, that's not even a story. That's, like, that's that's mm -hmm. not even... It's, like, 
half-assed hypothesis about what might happen in six years from now. And <laughs> yeah, I, I understand, but I like what YouTubers do in a, in a lot of respects is express how they feel about certain things, you know. And I, I know you're not necessarily all for that, but it's just. You know, I, feelings have to be, I think, compounded with knowledge. It has to be like a balance, I think. Yeah, and you're that's, absolutely that's... right. You're absolutely right. But it, when things keep happening and happening and happening, it's hard not to just go out there and be like, what is ha like, is what what can we look forward to? Because right now it doesn't, something doesn't feel right, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think a lot of changes in, in, in status quo happen because of, people came out and said, this doesn't feel right. And again, I know it has to be compounded with knowledge. Absolutely. And which is why I think what you do is so important because but I, I guess uh, young, what I'm, what I'm not seeing here is that like, I mean, I get you when you say like, you're mm. upset about battlefront. I understand that I'm not a battlefront fan. So I personally don't care about that, but I am extremely upset that sweet Coden, which is this JRPG series mm. made by Konami mm. has been killed. And, and Konami is like, who knows yeah. what, kind of pachinko machines right. they're making these days and right. that that hurt breaks my heart mm. that that series will never see another entry that mm. like they mm. released a psp game in japan that we never got in english and and it just breaks my heart the way that they've treated that it breaks my heart the way that nintendo treats its classic games a mm. lot of companies treat all oh, yeah. their classic games sure. but but it is so hard for me to get angry about any of the things that that are just annoying or depressing to me because when i look at my games of the year and what we mm. do at kotaku is we each put together a list of like mm. our 10 50 favorite games of the year and i was thinking about like what are my 10 and uh, already it's it's november and i'm having trouble making a list of mm -hmm. 10 because i played so many incredible games this year and For like sure. you're asking what what there is to look forward at and it's like i mean from no, for Hollow sure, but, Knight but, but, to but Into for, the Breach to but Bethesda, so many freaking games. Yeah, but Bethesda makes these amazing games that I loved growing up, right? And we want to see Bethesda succeed, specifically Bethesda. And so mm -hmm. it's not that I'm angry that there won't be anything down the line. I know there's so much to look forward to. I don't know what Death Stranding is, but I'm freaking curious as hell, and I'm looking forward to that, and I'm happy that I can still look forward to that. I but... thought you had like 400 theories about what it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, theories, but I still have no idea, honestly. But um, I can look forward to that and still be upset about oh, Bethesda. Can can we can we make pro or can express concern of can we make progress? Can we move past the the launches like Fallout seventy six and actually ship a product that 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 will realize your full potential? Because Bethesda is a company with so much like imagination and 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 so much ambition, and I love that. But, so let me ask you something, Young. Have mm -hmm. you ever reached out to Bethesda and said, hey, I would like to talk to Todd Howard about this stuff? Well, would he... I should do that. I mean, I've reached out to, you know, PR departments, but, you know, what, what, they're not, they're not going to... Why would they let me speak to Todd Howard? Why not? I don't know. Because you, yeah. you have a YouTube channel. You have a popular YouTube would you, channel. Would you I be mean, able to connect me with them? And I'd, I'd love to no, speak with them. No, because Bethesda hasn't talked to right. me in five years. They, oh, so. yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> I'll come with you for that. There you go. But, but the point is, I mean, I think that I, I hear you. I get it. I love Skyrim. Mm -hmm. And then I was super disappointed by Fallout 4 because right. suddenly they turned this incredible, like, nuanced series from right. Vegas to uh, to this, like, shoot fest where right. you can't even make more than four dialogue choices. And it's all just, yeah, that, that game mm -hmm. really disappointed me. Mm -hmm. And I, I hear you on mm -hmm. that. But, but. Sorry, I shouldn't interrupt Jason in the middle of what he's saying. That's <clears throat> probably you wrote one, sir. We all was going through, you went through with Halo. Your boy's so invested. Oh, poor guy. I wonder if you have any opinions on Destiny, actually, now that you mentioned Halo. Um, the game I've struggled with. Uh, like, what we're seeing here, and in some ways, Yong is a great representative of this side of the discussion because it's kind of like he's, it's like I said very early on, um, he's kind of like taken a bite of the, the fruit of the tree of knowledge, and he's exited the garden. And he doesn't understand what he has to look forward to. He's growing up. He's become gone from being a child who is an unsophisticated consumer of video games to being a sophisticated consumer of video games. And he sees things he didn't used to see. And he's despairing of that. Everyone goes through that. And you should go through that. There's this great quote from Dune that I'm going to misquote now. 
Do you play Destiny and Scott's problems for sure? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Agreed. There's a great quote from Dune. I'm not going to get it right, so I'm just going to try to paraphrase it. <clears throat> Describing um, the sect of, like, witches, which are kind of like the Jedi of this universe, of the Dune universe, the Bene Gesserit. And it talks about how these, these, this all-female order of basically sorceresses, um, how they must use their beauty and their charisma at the same time they hold people at bay and they um uh and oh fuck i'm i'm going to misquote this and it's going to make me sound misogynistic but the basic idea that it rolls up to and i'm going to try to find this quote and say it later is that when you hold things that are apparently contradictory, but also apparently true. If you can hold things, these in your mind. And if you diligently hold these two, two things or even multiple things that are all apparently true, but apparently contradictory in your mind for long enough, that's where wisdom eventually comes from. Um, I'm learning a lot about something called dialectical thinking, which is basically the ability to function in the midst of contradictory principles and ethics. Um, and I think what we're seeing here is a great example of that. Publishers are exploitative and take advantage of their audience. And gamers deserve better from publishers, game publishers. At the same time, gamers are vitriolic and, and hard to please and tend to amplify the worst, simplest interpretations of what's going on in social media. And game publishers and developers don't deserve that. But also on both sides of that, there are great games getting made with good business models and there is also excellent discussion happening. All these things are true. Don't worry, you won't tell anyone. I appreciate that one, Sirzu. Um, and I'm not really putting this in a way that's very clear, I'm sure. So I'm not going to dwell on it. But the heart of it is, Yong is going to have to learn to hold his disappointment with these publishers and also his excitement at the games these publishers are making next to each other. And if you do that for long enough, that's where wisdom and the ability to understand how to act in complicated situations comes from. And if you're young, you just haven't had enough experience doing that. You haven't had enough opportunity to do that. I get it. I really think a lot of that, a lot of this conversation is just that. Just a number of years. And Jason is um just been in it longer. That's a cool way of looking at it. Thanks, man. Appreciate that. Okay. But it's it's the type of thing where, like, mm -hmm. I feel like the way to convey that opinion would mm -hmm. be, A, to criticize and make sure that people see, like, here's what you guys are doing wrong. Here's what you could be doing better. But, B, to make sure that what I'm doing is not just, like, like – perpetuating this outrage machine where it drives those talented Bethesda people to say, you know what, I work my ass off. I work mm -hmm. these 80 hour weeks sometimes to ship these games that are these ambitious like like RPGs that only we make that we just are working our asses off on. Mm -hmm. And then all I see is people getting angry and calling me a cuck on the internet about it. Mm -hmm. Like Lex says, I think the, the problem is that there is you have the people I think the problem is there is you have the people that like certain games delude themselves. There's no middle ground sometimes on either side. Yeah. And just the idea that simple ideas or representations that they went out over, over nuanced ones. Um, I guess like if you, if you tend to honor the aggregated opinions of many people over like 
the nuanced opinions of a few people you trust, that's a paradigm you can fall into. The idea that like what's true is this uncontrollable, shitty reality of opposites that cannot reconcile. And I think it's a reality that we all suspect exists because of the way social media works and well, at least how it works so far. Um, I think that we can all do ourselves a favor by acknowledging that the nature of reality might not be the simple black and white dualism that is kind of presented by popular narratives. Like, look at what's going on with GameStop right now. That's, that's a great example of that kind of situation. Um, it's a bunch of grown-up children with money acting like children. Narrative A. Narrative, narrative B is it's a, it's, it's a bunch of, uh, it's class warfare, right? Probably it's a little bit of both and a little bit of neither. And it's not simple. And I guess I've just learned, and maybe I'm temp temperamentally inclined to favor the comp, the, the the, as I said, the nuanced opinion of a trusted source over the aggregate opinions of the masses. Um, and uh, I guess that's why I was attracted to this in the first place, because Jason's one of those guys who writes those nuanced opinions. I just wish he'd write some of them on Twitter. <laughs> that, to me, is what really worries me. And just anecdotally, I hear all these stories about people who are just infuriated and, and burning out of the industry as a result of that. And that is not to say that people shouldn't be criticizing because it's really important to criticize mm -hmm. and it's really important to keep talking about the bugs and mm -hmm. the problems with a game like Fallout 76. And from what I hear, I mean, from what I've seen so far, it looks like a pretty bad game and mm -hmm. I don't really know. It, it just feels like a misguided stab in the first place yeah. at, this, at this series. But it is important to do that without create without just like like facilitating this outrage culture because I think that is really really bad for the video game industry and like it can hurt us in intangible ways that we might not even be aware of. Right. Like, it, but I don't know how to not express concern. I, I got to pee, ladies and gents. I'll be back in like three minutes. I just saw that excellent joke about streaming. One cert zoom from my uh, my pee break. It's quite the pun, sir. Kudos to you. <laughs> Let's get back into this. I, I don't know how to not... Um... You should express concern. I'm not telling you not to express. I, I think you should be totally honest with your feelings. You should yeah. you should keep telling your audience exactly how you feel. I mean, I think honesty yeah, no, is yeah, really important. Having that personal connection with your audience is really important. Mm -hmm. But... All I'm asking, and this is not just you, but pretty much everybody, not like my colleagues, this is something mm -hmm. we talk about internally, is to just make sure, think about what you're saying. And here, actually, here's something that my boss, Steven mm -hmm. Totillo, uh, tells me all the time. And sometimes mm -hmm. I don't take this advice and it always winds up backfiring. All right. w what you are saying, either like in an article, in a podcast, on Twitter, in a video, mm -hmm. whatever else, would you say this to the face of the person you're talking about? And mm -hmm. if the answer is no, reconsider what you're saying and i think that is a really good way to be fair because mm -hmm. you can be really critical mm -hmm. about something but if you say it in a way that is like just imagine you're looking at the person in the eye and you're saying look this is how i feel about this mm -hmm. that automatically just like prevents you from turning into this just angry creature where you're just screaming sure. and railing about yeah for this. sure um and by the way, if I met Bobby Kotick, I would be like, how can you, like, sleep at night taking a $28 million <laughs> yeah. yearly bonus? Or, you know, uh, the, the folks uh, at EA, Andrew Wilson has a pretty big paycheck. Um, yeah, it's it's ridiculous. It, it's, it is ridiculous. Th that is, I mean, you want to talk about problems <clears throat> in the yeah, video. Industry. for sure. That is, the, the root problem is that the CEOs are making 400 times what their employees make, mm -hmm. and their employees are slaving away and just, like, working their asses off on these games mm -hmm. and not seeing, I mean... 
capitalism problems in general <laughs> right yeah capping sure. capping ceo pay and capping the the amounts uh, on these investors yeah. and man if you want a real the real story in the video game industry mm -hmm. is that like these companies the way these companies operate is not based on like what is going to make us the most profit or well it is it's based on what's mm -hmm. going to make us the most profit but it's not based on like like Activision does not have a successful quarter if they made money that quarter. What right, they need right. is to make more money exactly. than they made in the yeah. previous uh, year. Yeah, quarter. exactly. They're and in the business of financial growth. Like that that's sort of the main thing, really. Yes. And that is the problem. And that is the fundamental reason that we're seeing so many of these like mm -hmm, monetization mm -hmm. schemes that are so that feel mm -hmm, so like, mm -hmm. like real terrifying shit. and horrible and, and just dangerous mm -hmm. to us. And and companies are just I mean, that's what they need to do. And this yeah. whole system is fundamentally yeah. flawed. Yeah. And ultimately, I mean, I don't know what the solution is to that. Yeah, if I, mean, I had it, I would right. be saying it. But right. like if you want to get mad at something, don't get mad at Wyatt Chang. Get mad at the, yeah. the way that they traded companies work. Yeah, I mean, I've, I was never mad at Y Chang. I... I read somewhere that the reason CEO pay is so high is because it's a highly risky, highly difficult, highly, highly um, high stakes job. And it's just about the competition for people who can and will do those jobs. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, I, I actually want to hear, I'm going to look up Jason's stuff after this and see if he has anything more about that. Because, like, everything that's happening with cyberpunk actually really raises the question of, like, what is the role of investors? What is the role of, um, of decision makers at a high level on the games that are getting, getting released and what, how they get released and when they get released? Interesting stuff. I, uh, he handled it really well, all things considered, I think, but it, it sucks. Like, it, it sucks that he was put in that position. Um, but, but yeah, the, yeah, the, the re all, all things considered, I absolutely agree that the main thing to, to really be angry about, if there is something to be angry about, is absolutely the, the people at the top of the pyramid, you know, because mm -hmm. they ultimately direct Because they're not this. the ones who built that pyramid. Yeah, exactly. They're, yeah, they're not the ones who built that pyramid, exactly. So, yeah, I... I we can see eye to eye there and hopefully, I, and the thing is, I don't know, how do I reach out to these folks and, you know, write, write a, yes, yeah, I don't know. And that's, that's the thing I think also they hide behind the veil while putting the game devs out there to take the brunt of the. Very true. Very true. Um, but I think you are in a position um, where where you could certainly be reaching out to mm -hmm. developers and, and okay. talking to people and yeah. trying to get more uh, uh -huh. informed answers to some sure. of your questions, which I, I mean, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't want to tell you what. Yeah, like this is an entirely other discussion. Like I. No person needs that kind of money. But whether the way market forces work or should work is completely outside of any claim of expertise I can lay. Can't agree or disagree with you on that. What to do again, but I, I would I, love nothing more than to no, do that, honestly, but it's just, yeah, I mean, nothing's uh, stopping him. Would you be able to, I don't know, aid me a little bit and reach sure. out? Sure. Let me know who you, who you need, which company okay. you want contact information for, and I'll hook you up. Fair enough. Um, so I have, we've been talking for about an hour. I have mm. a few more minutes if you want to talk about some of the questions, if you sure. want to pick any of these reader questions that you um, got. Now, I know you discussed uh, that we, you, we eventually want to get to the particular questions, <laughs> but do, do you think we cover that enough or do you want to go back? I'm kind of tempted to take the bait, talk about CEO pay. But honestly, I just know so little about it. I, under, I both understand the argument that no person earns 10, 20, 30, 50 million dollars a year no one does that. But at the same time, like the idea that a person's decisions can create that much value when multiplied over a big enough scale, like kind of seems like it makes sense to me. But again, like I just, I don't know. Um, so we're an hour into an hour, 23 minute interview. I hope these, this Q and A at the end is interesting. Um, I'd also be okay if this was a good stopping point because we've been at this for a little while. But uh, let's just see how it plays.
go back to that. Uh, the um, like the game yeah, journalism. It's up to you. Whatever, and whatever it's you want. You, well, we, I, I think we... this one's really good. And multiple users, uh, multiple users asked okay. this: Where do you see the gaming industry in five years in terms of game services, business models, so on? Is it? Do you see good prospects, bad prospects, a mix of both? So okay, so I think that when when these people are talking about the gaming industry, and mm-hmm. when we talk about the gaming industry mm-hmm. in general, we're talking about the big the big companies, mm-hmm. Activision and Ubisoft right. and EA and all these big companies. And I think they're all trending in this direction that we've watched for the past few years, where it's like fewer games, more games as a service, where it's got these models that are streaming. Everyone, Risk it for the excuse biscuit? me. Everyone wants their Fortnite. Um, everyone right, wants sure. to make a Fortnite. Um, Bobby Kotick is probably looking down at his employees and saying, "Why don't?" we have a Fortnite. Oh, yeah. um and and i mean this is that inertia will continue mm-hmm. uh even through net, new consoles and digital advancements and streaming and that sort of stuff um what i'm excited about is just the the way that the independent game scene has just exploded mm-hmm. and yeah. created these yeah. incredible things i mean hollow knight i mentioned this before mm-hmm. one of the best games i've ever played in my life <laughs> i played that this year on the switch and i was just blown away um into the breach is one of my favorite games this year i played divinity original sin 2 oh, which is made God. by an independent yeah. studio so- and so that good. is like the best isometric RPG. Mm-hmm. Probably beats Baldur's Gate 2 for me. Mm-hmm. Um, so that to me is really exciting. And I don't yeah. see that uh, stopping anytime yeah. soon, which is really cool to yeah. see. Uh, the thing I'm worried about is that... It- so games that don't have to succeed at the biggest scale possible. Continuing to improve and develop and iterate. Yep. Love that. Love that. Like that that's one of the pieces of... Th- that's one of the things I keep chirping about Planet Side. As long as we have planet side people in the chat, let's drop that in. It doesn't need to be the biggest game ever. It just needs to be work for people who will play it. If game developers don't, and I think this addresses one of the other questions, if game developers don't mm-hmm. find a way to combat <laughs> uh, their shitty work conditions, ideally through unionization, because that's the only solution that I see, right. then I'm worried about like wide scale burnout and. Uh, just yeah. the unsustainability of the current crunch practices. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. that's something. I mean, I would love to see, and I certainly would 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 be in favor of game developers unionizing within the next five years. Mm-hmm. So hopefully, we'll see that. Um, do you think? You know, do you think we're making headways towards that? Do you think it's? There's been. There's certainly been. I don't know if there's headways. I haven't heard of any sure. companies actually making an effort to do mm-hmm. it yet. But there's been more conversation about it this year than ever mm-hmm. before. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that just at GDC of this year, the game developer conference in san francisco there was Mm -hmm. a lot of momentum talking about it there's a group called game workers unite that Mm -hmm. has popped up and started trying to get Mm -hmm. grassroots organization efforts going so there's certainly more uh these days uh, yeah more momentum than we've ever seen i think especially after what happened with uh, telltale i think there's Mm -hmm. been uh, more of a a conversation yeah, surrounding it um yeah okay. because it's not like i mean a union couldn't have made telltale or couldn't have prevented telltale from shutting down mm-hmm. but a union could have ensured that they got paid severance and they mm-hmm. were all just left on the street without anything mm-hmm. which is what happened mm-hmm. um and Terrible the union story. could have put uh one of the game developers in the negotiation room and just had given them a seat at the table, which I think is is the best way to ensure that the the big CEOs at the top of the pyramid aren't making every single decision without at least a little bit of input from the people who are at the bottom. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Collective bargaining. Like, the problems the developers run into is that when they're negotiating with companies is that the company has the power of the entire company at its back when they're, when they're negotiating the relationship that they will have with the developer who's working for them. But the developer just has the resources of them own damn selves and maybe their family. Um, it's a complete, it's an enormous power imbalance from a negotiation perspective. Um, both when entering employment agreements and just when this, when deciding how to do work. Um, so yeah, once you have collective bargaining, then it's more likely that the concerns that affect individuals, individual developers, um, will get uh, time at the table, like working conditions. And I mean, game development has been like a an industry of passion. I think, like a lot of artistic callings, like probably like TV and movies, same kind of idea. And because of that, like companies that make them can rely on passionate people to work 
beyond the value that they get back from the companies that employ them because some of the value they get is just from being able to work on something that matters to them. There's a lot more to it, of course, but, um, and I think I read something about unionization at a larger game studio recently. I might have to, I'm not sure if I can cross-reference that quickly or not. Lex says, having worked multiple union jobs, I have to say that unions only as strong as the workers who are educated about it. You'd imagine major pushback against any kind of unionization in that industry. Yeah. Yeah, unionization is, there's a lot, I know there's a lot that goes into it. I know there's examples of really bad unions too, right? Um, do you think, Lex, though, that there's some room for collective bargaining where industry, where, where game development or game developers are concerned? Like, or is it better served the way it is now where people just um, negotiate as individuals? It always tough. It always sucks to have creative work be regulated. Kind of like earlier in this stream when we were talking about how Amazon can't seem to make a good video game, about how a business culture based around statistics um, might choke the creative process that needs to happen when building a game that has a hook people care about. Uh, this is just speculation. I don't actually know a lot about unionization, but this is an interesting topic. Um, yeah. I, yeah, uh, I, I agree with all of that. Uh, now, uh, Can't say this question I, I find interesting. Word. Goulash from YouTube says, uh, or he asks us to talk a bit about uh, PS, uh, not the PS5 rumors, and but mainly the Sony not appearing at E3 uh, 2019. Uh, what do you overall make of that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting. I I, I assume... So I, I know that they've still got at least a couple of PS4 things left in the works mm -hmm. that they haven't announced yet. Yeah. Um, but I do think that... Do we care about these questions, guys? I don't know if we do. Their, the bulk of their show would have been uh, the games we saw last Ghost Death of Tsushima Stranding and Last of Us yeah. 2 and Ghost of Tsushima yeah and already it's like okay we've seen enough of these games year after year and Sony got some flack for doing that with like God of War and Spider-Man and Horizon where they just kept showing them um, so it makes sense for them to pull out um, I think the sense that I've gotten and what I've heard from people who are like mm -hmm. in the know or hearing that buzz is that Sony just like does not see E3 as like good for them and they don't want to be discussion surrounding we're going to scan around see if this is interesting what constitutes like a good leak like what what makes that oh leaks because sometimes it might spoil uh anyone who thinks that i'm a corporate shell the the number of things that like the number of times that i've pissed off these publishers by talking about things like this <laughs> right. is just like like it's so funny to see that expressed when like i have a rolodex full of pr people who i have pissed off for one reason or another because of all these things that we have been reporting it's it's just hilarious it's it's i found it very amusing and and hopefully these people educate themselves a little bit yeah um i mean yeah i've seen uh, i've never really ever subscribed to that idea uh, I've, I, I appreciate it yeah you've uh I mean, I followed you. I think the first time I, I took notice of your work was uh, when, when I do actually want to ask this. When you leaked um, the Fallout 4 script um, and there is some discussion surrounding what constitutes like a good leak. Like what what makes that because sometimes it might spoil something, but other times it might be informative. Like I think uh, the Fallout 76 uh, leak where, where you talked a bit about that. This is going to be an online survival RPG. And I think you made a fair point where. Um, pre-orders went up, but there was really barely any information about the game, so I think it was important. Yeah, so and I'm a Bethesda corporate shell, so I, I <laughs> right. clearly wanted didn't want people to know what the mm -hmm. game was. No, the, the Fallout 4 thing is interesting. So I actually think that a lot of people are just super uh, misinformed because I actually saw, I think it was on one of your videos, mm -hmm. I saw a YouTube comment that was like, Jason Trier leaked the entire script of Fallout 4 before it came out and spoiled the game. And actually, if you go back and you look at the article, and it's still online, mm -hmm. you yeah. can find it. Just search Kotaku Fallout 4 mm -hmm. leak script mm -hmm. um so first of all important distinction journalists don't leak we are le things people leak things to us yeah, we right. do not leak right mm -hmm. so i did not okay. leak fallout 4 people leak uh, the fallout 4 <clears throat> script to me so what happened was 
someone sent me about 10 pages of the script. On that script was, and I'm going to spoil the intro of Fallout 4, but on that script was actually um, there were a few details, a few random scenes, and then there were details of uh, how you get frozen and your wife or husband is killed and then your son is kidnapped, right? Mm -hmm. And so what we actually chose to do was we chose to pr print a couple of the pages, but not the ones that would spoil the story because mm -hmm. we didn't want to spoil the story. Sure. And if you go back and you look at that, you can see that. So important context here, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I think a lot of people forget this or don't know about it. So when this was happening, what, there was this website called the survivor 2299.com. Do you remember this? Yes. It was basically, <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, it was this big ARG and it turned out to be a hoax, right? Yeah. And within that context, we said, hey, we know that Fallout 4 is real. A lot of our readers right now are just like super depressed and questioning this and are like, oh my God, like this, this all turned out to be a hoax. Is Fallout not happening? What should we do? Yada, yada, yada. So we decided, okay, we are going to post a couple pages from the script to prove that we know it's real. We are going to put it in this context of like, yes, this thing was a hoax, but Fallout 4 is real. It's happening. It's set in Boston. Mm -hmm. That We're not going to spoil the story or anything, but that's what we're going to tell you because this is very newsworthy right now. It's not just spoiling an announcement for the sake of spoiling an announcement. It's within this context, there mm -hmm. is news to it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what we did. And we posted a couple of script pages and we said, hey, here's what we know. This game is in, in, in development. It'll be out in a couple of years. And that's mm -hmm. the end of it. Um, it's a very far cry from what people have said, yeah. which is that we spoiled the entire story of Fallout 4, which is nonsense. Right. And we wouldn't do that mm -hmm. um, or at least I wouldn't do that mm -hmm. so yeah just just clearing that up mm -hmm. for people um, but yeah but that was our logic and these days uh, at least my personally my perspective on leaks and when to talk about things have changed like for example we knew or I knew back in uh, a while back that mm -hmm. the next Assassin's Creed or that Odyssey was set in Greece yeah um, I actually know what the next Assassin's Creed already is but but we decided uh <laughs> not to like just spoil these things for the sake of spoiling them and instead we we decided we we've had a lot of conversations about this and a lot of debates about this and and now our thought is like if there is news value to this if there is context mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. this that makes it an important thing to talk about right. um diablo 4 is an example of a game that i will be talking about soon mm -hmm. because there is important context around it right mm -hmm. now okay By that um it's legit it, was that leak ultimately what Got, got you banned from black it was one right? of the things it was actually in the context of a few other things there was also um we said that arcane was making prey right, uh, right. a new prey 2 it was called back then um and they were pissed off about that because we made it clear that they were misleading people misleading gamers when they said that they arcane wasn't doing uh, yeah. a, a new uh, a new prey mm -hmm. and then that was one thing and then i also ran a story in april of 2013 about doom 4 um, being in development hell and this was like mm -hmm. as they were just rebooting mm -hmm. and turning it into what would become doom 2016 mm -hmm. but back then it was going through serious Same. development struggles so it was a combination gotcha. of all the, those three stories that led to bethesda just piecing out and blacklisting us and okay. to this day by the way it's really amazing but uh, uh not a single game journalist or interviewer has asked pete hines who's bethesda's mm -hmm. marketing guy yeah. On the record, hey, what makes you think it's okay to blacklist a, an independent games outlet? So mm -hmm. that's very curious. Nobody, mm -hmm. Nobody's asked them that yet. Well, uh, maybe one day. Maybe, maybe one day. Maybe somebody watching this can put the question yeah. out there. Yeah, good luck. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, this one uh, I think is interesting. Jim J. Uh, 0103 from YouTube. What steps should be taken to minimize the garbage that plagues our industry? Uh, Force Crunch released. Uh, I mean, we kind of talked about this, but... Uh, yeah, like minimize stuff like force. It does telegraph a, um, a bit of a weakness, but as the publishing, they've blacklist someone like Jason that they believe they're vulnerable to attack from him and they need to protect themselves basically. I wonder why they feel so vulnerable games press compared to other publishers hmm. i wonder if anyone else has blacklisted jason crunch release release now mm. then fix later type of mentality non-loot box practices that overall hurt the games uh, industry and the value in the community maybe it's the microsoft deal maybe they've been working on it for a long time 
Maybe I'm connecting too many dots. <laughs> yeah, a few different things here. So force crunch, that has to come from game developers mm -hmm. and them just like like yeah. banding together. Unionizing in some way, I think, is, is the best solution there. Mm -hmm. um, I think... Uh, I mean, so buggy releases. I mean, that's a real problem. Just releasing mm -hmm. games that are games, games continuing to come out that are in bad shape. Um, I'm not sure what there is to do about that, other than like what we've seen traditionally is that um, what happens is that these uh, a game might sell well, like Assassin's Creed Unity, turn out to be super buggy, and then the next game will be punished for it. Yep. So mm -hmm. like Syndicate didn't sell well because mm -hmm. of that, um, and that. And this is worth mentioning in the case of like CD Projekt Red. CDPR sold so well on the strength of Witcher. How well will CDPR's next title sell? This is the way these things work. It works in movies, too. That almost feels like, I don't know, counterproductive, yeah. and it's almost too bad to see that. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't really have a, a, sure. a solution for that problem other than, like, I don't know, I mean, game publishers giving game developers the time they actually need. Right. Um, I do think that, like, one of the things that that we probably should have seen by now and maybe will see is uh games going up in price and i know 60 dollars is already super expensive uh -huh. but but i think that publishers are it's it, it feels like it's hit this false stopping point that that has not kept up with inflation uh -huh. and it just feels like games are getting bigger and bigger and you're still getting i mean it's ridiculous that like you get this you spend the same amount uh, same amount on red dead redemption 2 as you did on like i don't know two worlds back right. in the day, that terrible euro rpg <laughs> right. that was like garbage um and yeah i mean i don't know i i've been yeah. thinking about this a lot because while inflation has been going uh, and and the value of the dollar has been going down wages have been stagnating so yeah. it's not like people out there can suddenly afford to pay a bunch more money for the yeah. game. So it is a real problem. And I wonder, I do wonder what will happen if they, like a mm -hmm. publisher says, Hey, we're going to make our other games $70 or $80 or right. whatever. I, I, I do worry about yeah. like what the results. I'm... Haven't we seen recent stories about AAA games talking about releasing for $70 or $80? This kind of rings a bell for me, although I can't recall a specific anecdote and I'm fairly certain the reaction was, as you'd expect, overwhelmingly negative. Excuse me. And I think that um, we know the answer, right? It's microtransactions. As they find another way to get the money. Because although the amount of value you get out of these titles might be worth more than $60. Um, it's just, uh, it's just a, uh, like, like a hard barrier. The games, I don't know if they'll ever break through it. At least not until there's like a change in the technology. But I think as long as we're still playing 3D games on 2D screens, 60 bucks is where we'll be stuck. I mean, there's some argument that because of all the different editions that they put out there for the games, the deluxe editions that come with uh, the exclusive mission, the exclusive right. content that on, in some respects, they've already kind of jacked up prices just a little That's more true. underhandedly. And the new trick, the trick that we're going to start seeing even more now is pay more to play the game early. Early. That's one of the questions actually. Yep. Uh, any thoughts on that? Any inside perspectives? Yeah, I think it's conniving and kind <laughs> yeah. of brilliant of these publishers because it's oh, like yeah. they, they know are. that like everyone wants to be the first person talking about something yeah. and hey, give yeah. us an extra twenty bucks and you could be the first wave talking about this game. And right. man, it's that 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 is certainly shady. Um because if a game is ready and can be played by people like yeah, just who bought fucking the, release it. Yeah, who pre ordered, who already bought it, who've already kind of committed to, hey, I'm gonna yeah, buy this product, they get they get it late because they didn't subscribe or whatever. Yeah, it's weird. I mean, that, I mean, yeah, I certainly think that is shadier than some of the other things mm -hmm. we've talked about. So uh, I think uh, we're at a good place. Uh, I guess I'll just ask one more question to leave this yeah. th things off on a more positive note. Uh, which game do you think will win uh, Game of the Year, and what's your personal Game of the Year? Oh, man. So uh... do we care about this? For completeness' sake, I'm, I'm going to go through it. But I, this is not what I showed up for. 
I don't really. I mean, my game of the, my personal game of the year just kind of oscillates. Like mm. I mentioned, some of my favorites. Into yeah. the Breach is one of my favorites. Um, God of War, Spider Man, mm. Red Dead Two, mm. Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Um, All AAA single player games. It's odd how little I relate to that world anymore. Some others that I am not even thinking of right now, but I haven't had a chance to. Play. I guess another breach is not a triple A game. Sorry. Play everything that I want to play just yet. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a long, a long list. Get with the times, geezer. I, Come on, Jason. I'm considering this game called Return of the He's Obra Dane. His... Everybody's been raving about it. I'm super excited to His play that. Game media so it's hard the for game me to stop. answer that last question. Sure. Um, I think that. Uh, just like at the Game Awards in a couple of weeks, um, I think it'll pretty easily be Red Dead 2. Oh, yeah. Um, although it is the first year in a while that we've had real competition because mm -hmm. it's either going to be that or God of War. Uh, I think Red Dead 2 has impressed enough people and just mm -hmm. does so many innovative things uh -huh. as opposed to God of War, which is kind of just like... I feel like Game God of War is a very video-gamey video, like... game, -y video game. Yeah. It's very much like like, like the, the distillation of everything that makes for a good action uh, action mm -hmm. game. Like, do gamers and actually just care about does this everything stuff? really well. Red Dead 2 is this weird, wonderful, just yeah. crazy, like... It's a it's an absurd video. Yeah, there's nothing just, like that out there right now. Yes, um, it is just very unusual, and I think that'll be rewarded. And I also think that uh, for in a oh, good question. Do you not play single player games because you're not interested in them, or you don't have the time for them? Um, probably go with an option C for me, and it's because I play games predominantly like in a social way. Like for me, like. Sometimes I'm not sure whether I'm playing the game to connect with people or whether I'm, I'm and, and like using the game as like a platform for discussion and communication and connection or for the game itself. Like I kind of need both, which is kind of why I started doing this. I mean, on a normal night, on a normal Monday night, two years ago, I would be sitting here playing a video game rather than talking to y'all. But I figured out that I needed this in my life. But to answer your question, I, there are some single-player games I do play. Like, I mentioned Skyrim before, but they tend to be exceptions for me. Um, I'm heavily attracted to online worlds. Lex, yeah, because then they can buy a Game of the Year edition for 10 bucks more with some bullshit. Yeah. I mean, I guess you can talk about the most impactful games. That's kind of, I guess, what Game of the Year kind of means. I just think it's it's too broad of a category in a way. Like it, it's so broad, it's 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 not that meaningful. Um, like, what's the most well-selling AAA game that journalists generally like? Like, I don't know. In some ways, game of the year every year is like that FIFA game, right? That's a game that that makes the most money in the whole world, or 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 just a random, a random cell phone game that makes more money than like the next five like games that we talk about combined. Uh, it's a weird world out there. But I do like single player games, but I tend to need to just, I like go through times in my life where I feel like I need them. Um, and then I go back to my normal ways of like needing the connection. Um, exceptions I've made in recent years for single player games would be Skyrim, Witcher 3, What else? Doom 2016. Game of the Year reminds you of Truck of the Year. <laughs> Truck of the Year. <laughs> What's that? What was the Truck of the Year in 2020, Lex? That's funny. <laughs> what is Truck of the Year? That's what we need to know. Real talk. Oh, JD Power is yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. You, you see that on um on commercials, right? <laughs> JD Power and Associates, blah blah blah. Whatever the hell JD Power and Associates is. <laughs> yeah. No, I wish like in an alternate universe where I had more time in the day, every day, I would probably devote two or three hours a day to playing single-player games. But I just... I... 
the day is only 24 hours long and I have too much other stuff going on, uh, per, which is really dominated for the most part by my, you know, the job that makes all this possible. I have the luxury right now of being on Twitch without needing to make any money from it, which is an, a nice spot to be in. Um, I'm not beholden to anyone. I'm not accountable to anyone. Um, I kind of like it that way. But uh, definitely don't have the time to play single player stuff. Single player stuff I'd like to play that I don't think I have time for right now. Outer Wilds is a game that I started and never finished. I'd like to play through that game. It's very cool. Um, I never finished Doom Eternal. But I'm kind of okay with that. I'm not sure I really need to finish that game. Um, my buddy Taylor bought me a copy of Dishonored like a year and a half ago as a Christmas gift that I never played it. <laughs> so I probably should play that someday. Uh, but to be honest, when I think about playing single player games, all I want to do is go back and mod and play Skyrim. Like I feel like that, that tickles that itch for me. And there's a bonus like community aspect to playing and modding Skyrim because like there's a whole modding community that you get to kind of bounce off of between sessions. Doom 2016 for you is much more enjoyable. Same here, Lex. Um, I wonder if this is like I thought it was kind of like a hot take opinion, but maybe maybe more people feel the way I do. I kind of feel like for me, um, Doom Eternal it was pretty cool, but for a single player game, it felt like a way a lot more gamey than I needed it to be. And I was I was okay with just like having the game be more about mood and setting. Way too bloated platforming shit. I didn't mind the platform stuff. I mean, it wasn't bad, but it also wasn't necessary, I think. But I get like if you're a designer at it, you wouldn't want to make the same game. Um so I get why they did what they did. It's kind of like a designer's game in a way. Like, um, I wonder how Doom, the next Doom game, will turn out. But uh, yeah, I think that the the hook for Doom Eternal was nowhere near as good. Like having this weird space station as a hub world and teleporting around like it's just not as cool as like showing up in hell and stomping demons mick gordon didn't do the music in the new one mick i would love to know more about the mick gordon situation um he did write the music but apparently there was like miscommunication or um missed missed due dates by mick with getting stuff done and so they had to have a sound producer like go through and just like put shit together from unfinished stuff from Mick. Um, yeah, to do the mix. That's right. That, that's what I read too, Lex. And so, like, when Mick says, says that that's not my mix, it's like, well, yeah, it's not your mix, but, like, you didn't fucking get yours done on time, asshole. So, like, the id guy is, like, punched back at Mick big time. And my kind of read on that situation was that, like, it's just a situation where Mick didn't... I don't know why, but he didn't get his shit done on time. And he didn't communicate about it. And then when he acted like a baby, and then and, and then he had to kind of he had to kind of like a baby when the music thing was kind of dragged up, and uh, it had to call a spade a spade to to make it clear that they weren't the boogeyman. I'm guessing that there's more to that situation that we don't know about. I mean, if if Mick didn't communicate well with it, it's kind of, I wouldn't be surprised if he's not communicating well with his audience either. Maybe he's going through some shit. I don't know. I will say though that, um, the sound that Mick created is fucking unique and incredible. I still jam out to those fucking tracks. If he's gone from this series, that's a huge blow for you. The music was a big part of the game. Same, same man. I feel the same way. Like I'm less, interested in Doom Eternal knowing it's not his take. And I'm sure that he won't be involved in the next Doom game and it'll be some some talented person who's asked to duplicate his sound. And I'm sure that I will not enjoy it as much knowing that and I'm sure that it won't be what Mick could have done. The 2016 soundtrack was godlike. He didn't even play the game. Yeah, you don't need to play the game to jam out to that, dude. 
And my big problem with Doom 2016 with audio was the um the 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 3D mixing of the gameplay sounds and the fact that you could hear imp like grunting from everywhere in the map and the 3D sound made no sense. Even though they're like like just right next to you, you hear them like like they could be on the other side of the map, like behind in another room, and they'd be like, and then, like screaming in your ear. I didn't like that. That one bit. Not good. You hadn't heard of him not doing it when I was playing through it, but the tracks you liked were fewer and far between. They remember in 2016. Yeah. Yeah, I think that um I think that the 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 core of what's there was started by Mick, but I don't think he he took it the whole way. Is was my impression. Like he did with 2016. Which is a damn crying shame. What you gonna do? Well, let's hear what these guys think the game of the year was for 2018, shall we? Just for fun. In awards, awards in general, story is generally rewarded. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think Red Dead 2's storytelling is just going to put it over the edge. Yeah. Uh, is, is, correct me if I'm wrong, but is Fortnite up there as one of the nominees? It's one of the ongoing games. Oh, okay. But, okay. Not, uh, but not, and also I think it came out <laughs> last year, if okay. I remember correctly. Okay. Um. Because I know yeah, a couple a, game. a couple outlets already like they're saying Fortnite game of the year 2018. I think I, I might have seen that, but it's interesting. Yeah. I mean, in in today's world, the concept of game of the year is kind of strange and yeah. obsolete to begin with because so many of these games are just changing constantly. For sure. And like yeah. I don't know, it's it's games today. Games that came out this year are competing with well, like even games that came out last year are very different this year mm -hmm. than they were last year. So it's it's very bizarre, mm -hmm. a very bizarre world that I think we're all just kind of still trying to figure out the right words to mm -hmm. and the right like systems to deal with. I mean game reviewers, for example, it's difficult to review games because a game that you review in September might be totally different in October, right? right. Like you look yeah. at Destiny Two and that game is changing <laughs> so much constantly. Or, or that Warframe. A review yeah. just yeah or Warframe or Fortnite. Yeah. Like you look back at reviews of Fortnite from last year and it's like what yeah. um right. yeah it, it's it's a brave new world and mm -hmm. i think that people are just still trying to find ways to deal with it in in all sorts of ways mm -hmm. uh yeah uh I, i'd say that's a pretty succinct response right there and uh, cool. uh yeah I, I think uh i i can't promise that everything i do moving forward will necessarily agree with you but i i do definitely uh want to keep what uh things that were expressed here in mind moving forward um and so i that's think that's good it's... to hear and yeah i don't expect us to agree on absolutely uh, on a, yeah. everything um although i think yeah i mean i think we do agree on a lot of things mm -hmm. it's just that i see these a lot of these things as just like like annoyances or things that like might bother me a little mm -hmm. bit and i don't see them as like oh my god time to start a <laughs> customer movement about the like right. i i don't know i i it might just be because i'm getting old and just don't have the bandwidth to care as much or it might just be because i'm excited <laughs> about so many things in gaming that i just don't right. really like, care that much about the things that bother me but right. i don't know like i i could give a shit what ea is doing these days like i'm not expecting to enjoy yeah. anything ea puts out he's been in it too long um, my man i'm looking forward to anthem but part of me feels long. like yeah, who knows what Same. that is gonna be like and yeah, and that's, yeah, I mean, that's so, unfortunate. So for, yeah, it is unfortunate, but it's also for me, it's like instead of if, if Anthem ships and it has some bugs or it's like a, a 75 quality game or something like that or it crashes on launch or whatever it is. I, instead of like getting really angry about that, I don't know. I mean, maybe I, I think part of it to Jason must be like, it's just like old news. Buggy games come out, publisher does something dumb. Ask for too much money. It's like, yeah, it sucks, but like, what else is new? Seen this shit. We know how to deal with this. Can we move on? Put it in its proper context. And people who've been around longer know more of the proper context than people who are seeing some of this stuff for the first time. Babby's first, uh, you know, feels bad, man, microtransaction. People are conflating bringing up game developer de degeneracy with just being angry. Yeah. Yeah, I think Jason's doing a little bit of that. But uh, it's some, sometimes there is de just degeneracy floating around and you got to call it out. And sometimes it is legit. It's hard to know where the line is.
I just like, I mean, we'll certainly cover it and report on it and try to mm-hmm. figure out why it is happening. But just to to rail on it, just I don't know, it doesn't I, seem I, that productive for I me. Think but that's yeah, me. I think for me, uh, people are just so attached to certain studios they grew up with. So Anthem is Bioware, which is why I hope it's uh, just. You know, trying to reclaim the garden of Eden. but I also feel like it won't, <laughs> um, especially with the backpedaling on the storytelling. I elements. love these publishers. Which you know, Why we'll see how that works out. Me? I can't say for sure that that'll be bad or anything, but, mm-hmm. but you know, we're attached to Bioware, we're attached to Bethesda. So even if we have CD Projekt Red doing You're great things, we still want to see Bethesda pull through You're and attached them, y'all. not, uh, not and, or EA's Star Wars stuff. We want to see Star Wars be made in a way that's just fantastic and everyone can love. And when that doesn't happen, because uh, you know. The, the higher ups uh, interfere with that somehow. Uh, yeah, it for me it is it is something that I feel passionately pissed about sometimes, and uh, mm-hmm. th- that may be that may be the di- the dichotomy there that we may not always agree on. But also, I do understand that. Sit with that feeling, young. Figure out what that fucking means, man. Sit with it. Look at it. See what part of you is in that feeling. What part of the th- the experience is in that. What part of it is you you as a creator in that. You got to sit with those feelings and sometimes just like blasting them out there lets us just vent our feelings rather than dealing with them. I think that's the part, that's the part of growing up and detaching a lot of people never reach. Yep. And in fact, Lex, that, that's exactly like the general image I'm getting of some parts of this conversation is that Yang is just like a, in this conversation, he's kind of like a young dude who's transitioned from being an unsophisticated consumer of games as a child to being a sophisticated consumer. And what he's not realizing is it's not games that have changed. It's him. And that's the microphone drop moment. Yeah. Uh, I mean, something else to consider um, that is that might seem obvious, but is not something we mm-hmm. think about a lot, is that nobody wants to make a bad game. Even sure. Andrew Wilson is not like, I want to ship a bad game. Like he, every single person involved at EA wants to make the highest possible Metacritic games. They want to make the best possible things that they can make. But they'll cut corners, um, won't they? Right. Well, but so video games are very hard to make. And yeah. even if you give a team of people, a team of super talented people, like infinite budgets and unlimited time Mm -hmm. and i mean basically what blizzard does even if even if you do that that's still not a guarantee of Mm -hmm. success um look at blizzard look at titan look at starcraft ghosts like they Mm -hmm. have so many failures even though they have more resources than most companies Mm -hmm. and i think that's something that that doesn't excuse products that ship in buggy ways that doesn't excuse bugs (laughs) that doesn't make it so that doesn't that that isn't an excuse that isn't to that isn't going to nullify criticism it's not it shouldn't prevent criticism but it's something that i think uh we should all be thinking about when we try to have empathy for some of the people who are putting their all into this Mm -hmm. and even Fallout 76. I mean, a lot of people work very hard on that game. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people love that game, and we're hoping to make Elon it as great over as possible. Star Citizen? And even if it isn't, Elon weighs into it's all kinds still of shit, man. worth thinking about that. You guys like, got to be careful. As we are talking about these things, and just just sparing yeah. some thought for for, sure. uh, for for those people and for the people who who made these things. Yeah, yeah. Jason's responding to is yet yeah, is cutting corners. This is a very simple idea that reflects an unnuanced understanding of the way games get made. Everything is a flipping compromise when you're making something as complicated as a video game. Everything's a compromise. It's not like you get all of what you want or you cut some of it. You never get all of what you want. So, Young, you're not a kid. Don't act like one. And Jason, get with the times. Treat social media with the respect it deserves. Yeah, for sure. Having more empathy in general, I yeah, think, is that's something fair. that we could all do. Yeah, myself no, included. I, I couldn't disagree. Or, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more, uh, yeah. is what I'm trying to say. Um, well, but yeah, it, it's unfortunate. I think the, the developer side of things is, is to me, what what's more most like heartbreaking because like, I, I don't put out these videos and go, <laughs> ha, yeah. Like part of me, like there is a part of me that goes, the, the, the devs put a lot of work into this and it sucks. But I at the same time, you know, 
I have feelings about these things and sometimes I yeah I I don't think you should be dishonest or no. just uh, you should not hold back mm -hmm. your feelings but yeah. Yeah. Like I said, I mean, yeah, the thought process that I, I try to use and mm -hmm. fail to use, but just thinking like imagining that I'm in a room with, with this person that I'm talking about and and just um, imagining would I say this to this mm -hmm. person's face? Mm -hmm. If I wouldn't say this to this person's face, am I being mm -hmm. fair? And that's that's always the big question okay. that I want to ask is like, am I fair being enough. fair about this? Sure, that's and fair. That doesn't mean be dishonest. It doesn't mean hold back your criticisms. Mm -hmm. It just means try to I be fair, fair about them. And that's yeah. that's my perspective on Thanks. and what I hope to see, yeah. like the level of discourse raised to that level. Right. Yeah. No, it's a good I'm perspective to that. have. And at, at the very end of the day, at least I, I can fair. definitely say, you know, fuck the people at the top of the pyramid who <laughs> enable this shit. So. You know, I think this is a good, good stop. Here, here. As long as we have yeah. someone to cool. hate. Thank well, you thank so you much. Again. Yeah. Thank you so, well, thank you, Yang. I really appreciate you having on, me on here um, and letting me have a chance to mm -hmm. to talk with you a little bit and address your audience a little yeah, bit about these sure. issues and get my perspective out here. Yeah, I mean, uh, despite, even if we don't see eye to eye on everything, I, I've always respected your work. I've always respected your uh, work ethic. Big is an and RPG so, shill. Uh, I appreciate that. Yeah, I hope, uh, I don't know, true. we can stay in touch and... and <laughs> You know, I'd rather there be communication, even with disagreements, instead of you know, keep the back and forth. Uh, and, and you know, uh, I'll I'll take you up on seeing if you can hook me up with a few devs that I can honestly have a chat with and see what their perspective sure. is. I don't know if sure. they'll be able to tell me everything because, like you said, there's certain stipulations there. But you know, maybe I can get something out of that. Um, Fantastic. So yeah, but yeah, love to see that. yeah, look forward to to more of your work. And uh, I, I'm hoping for the best for the gaming industry as a whole and looking forward to all the amazing games that are that are in development yeah sounds good thank you young yeah all right um so uh with that everyone thank you for tuning in um i'll see you next time yong out i need a, a like a chirpy like exit thing like that a dig out yeah i don't think so that's kind of like dick out which sends an entirely different message I need a cringy exit. Yeah, totally. Aren't my uh, aren't my exits already cringy though? <laughs> okay. <laughs> wow. Okay, we got through it. I don't know. I didn't think I was going to get through that entire entire thing. I didn't know if I was. I knew it was ballsy to take it on. But that was really fun. And the first hour of it was super enjoyable to listen to. The last of it is like, it's some okay stuff mixed in with some newsy stuff, which is that that's the peril of doing news type content is it's just, it's dead content as soon as, as soon as time passes. But the, the first part of that conversation was pretty evergreen and uh, pretty, pretty good stuff. Um, well, and w when I say stuff like, you know, Yon Grow Up and Jason, you know, get with the times. I kind of say it tongue in cheek a little bit. Um, just simplifying an idea. Uh, nothing, none of those interactions are simple and none of the ideas are, are straightforward and unnuanced, but I think there's a kernel of truth there, both those gents. And uh, it was really fun to hear that conversation. Anyway, I probably need to call it a night here and get some actual sleep because I have an actual job to wake up for. It's actually not that far away. Um, this has been really fun, y'all. And uh, this is called Basement Side Weekly. That's what I'm calling it. I'm going to try to do it every single Monday night. And I'm still exploring what it's going to be. But what we just did is something I think I will repeat. What I did before that, where I read the article out loud, Probably something I won't repeat. It's a lot of talking. But yeah, um, I don't have anything on the, the schedule right now in terms of interviews, but I will continue to do this stuff and um, let this be my cringy exit. Thanks, y'all. And find me on twitch.tv. Slash TV. One third Zoom. You stuck around for this like whole thing, man. I've 
that's pretty amazing. You deserve some kind of a reward for that. And uh, YouTube, it's DeegBS. I'm on t Twitter, Deeg Thoughts, and you can find me places. I'm not that hard to find. And I'll be back for more soon. Peace.